And welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm David Berto. I'm the director of the International Security Program here at CSIS. And, uh, and I'd like to extend a welcome also to our, our viewers on the web. I suspect that the climate uh, this morning and conditions have increased the number of people who are on the web and decreased the number here, but it's, it's really a privilege to see all of you in the room. Um, I want to give you a reminder to take your electronic devices and silence them. I'll do the same with mine right now. Uh, and one other administrative item, uh, there are restrooms uh, down the hall. Uh, we'll have a break part way through. You can use them then. This is the latest in a series that we call the Military Strategy Forum. CSIS has been conducting these for uh, quite a number of years now. And we thank Rolls-Royce for their generous support in uh, underwriting this series. They've been our sponsor from the start, and, uh, and we're very grateful for their contribution. So thank you, Rolls-Royce. The, uh, the Military Strategy Forum has been a, a place to advance both public understanding and discourse on a, a whole host of important national security issues. And I think today we have an extended session for you in that, uh, in that light, if you will. First, our, our distinguished speaker, and then we'll be followed by a, a panel of experts to expand on an important related topic. Um, that topic, and you've seen copies of our report outside, is the future of ground forces. Our speaker, of course, is the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps. Now, ground forces and the future of ground forces is obviously about more than the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps is about way more than the future of ground forces. Uh, but the two are intertwined, as you'll see, as we wind our way forward this morning. Here's how we'll proceed. First, we'll have our speaker. Then we'll take questions from the floor. Uh, I'll come back up to the mic and, uh, and recognize you in our normal procedures. Uh, then we'll take a, a slight reconfiguration break, uh, bring up our panel, uh, which our senior fellow, Nate Fryer, will, uh, will lead, and he'll introduce the panel at that time. So I'll turn now to our, our featured guest, uh, General Joseph Dunford, the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps. Um, he is uh, the fourth of our vice chiefs that we've had here in this series. Uh, those of you who study Title X will know that the role of the vice chiefs is not broadly and well and precisely defined in Title X U.S. Code, which I think gives you a lot of maneuvering room. Um, but historically, the services have relied upon uh, the number two guy as the operator and the manager. Uh, but in today's environment, though, I think it's a way bigger job than that because it has to be taken in the much broader context. And, and those of you who have, have been paying attention to these issues know that we almost don't have uh, uh, a definition yet of how broad that context is going. So uh, budgets and drawdowns and future strategy, it's a dynamic that is ill-defined but rapidly evolving. General Dunford, of course, is very well prepared for that task, having served in nearly every important Marine Corps position in his career with just enough joint duty assignments uh, at various levels of the joint staff so that his Washington experience is enough that he can kind of know his way around here, but not completely contaminated, uh, unlike politicians. Um, Lisa may feel that way sometimes. Besides that, of course, more importantly from my perspective, he's a dyed-in-the-wool baseball fan, Boston Red Sox fan. And, uh, and, and a particular brand of that baseball fan, which only is a Red Sox fan, if you will. There's a certain level of uh, angst, I think, that comes with being a Red Sox fan that uh, only those who grew up in the area really know. Um, and I, how that qualifies you to be a Marine, I don't know. But the best Marines I've ever known were Red Sox fans. So <laughs> with that, sir, I will offer the mic to you. Hey, thanks for the introduction. Uh, actually, thanks for the job description. I, after 13 or 14 months in the job and not having clearly defined it, I'm glad to find out that no one knows actually what I'm supposed to be doing. That, that leaves me a lot of latitude. Hey, thanks for, uh, and I'm only using this, I, I guess, because they're, they're trying to broadcast it. Uh, thanks for falling out this morning uh, on a rainy Pearl Harbor day. Uh, it's a great day to, uh, to pause, to reflect on those who have sacrificed in the past. But it's also a pretty good day to look towards the future with some degree of humility, which is the first thought I had as I looked at the Washington Post earlier this morning and saw the date, 7 December, and said, you know, you're going to talk about the future security environment. And, and uh, there's plenty of reminders, many in the last year, about why you ought to look at the future with some degree of humility. But Pearl Harbor Day is certainly one of those occasions that, uh, that needs not much of an explanation in that regard. 
What I uh, wanted to do uh, during the presentation part, first get to your questions as quickly as we can, but rather than, uh, than talk a lot about the conclusions that we've drawn as we've wrestled with some pretty tough decisions that you're all aware of over the past year, what I really wanted to do is provide the framework within which we have made recommendations and decisions, frankly, uh, those decisions that fall within our purview, decisions over the past 12 months. And that way, when we have the question and answer period, you have the context within which we came to the conclusions that we did. So next slide, please. Really what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to provide you an historical perspective on drawdowns. I think it's important. You know, generals always get accused of fighting the last war. Uh, I don't want you to think I'm looking backwards to determine what we're going to do in the future, but I also think it would be equally irresponsible to not be informed by the past. And, and there are some, some critical parts of history that I think ought to inform us today as we go through this, what I believe to be uh, another one of those historic drawdowns in our nation's defense. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the future security environment, and again, more so uh, about the assumptions that we have made in the future security environment and why we have made those assumptions, uh, and I'd share those with you, again, open it up for discussion. And then the last thing is to talk about uh, where I believe the Marine Corps can make a unique contribution in that future security environment. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about was the framework within which we are going to deal with the challenges ahead. Uh, clearly, uh, I can't talk today about sequester. I don't know where we'll go with sequester. I can tell you where we are at the end of that $450 billion plus drill that we have just gone through. I can tell you the framework that we're using to look at the results of that $450 billion drill to see if we got it right, to see if we did it in balance. And I'm going I'm to share that framework with you because it's exactly the same framework we're going to use in the days ahead as we start to make even more difficult decisions potentially uh, in the wake of sequester. Next slide. Look, uh, I'm not going to give you a class on the iconic battle of Iwo Jima, uh, although 70 years after Pearl Harbor, I'm, I'm inclined to do that, but I won't do that. Uh, but I would tell you this. Uh, this is not the first drawdown in our nation's history. We all know that. Uh, we've had significant drawdowns in our nation's defense after World War II, after Vietnam, after the Cold War. Uh, I have gone back and looked at the post-World War II period because I think it's very instructive. Uh, if you take a look at that picture in Iwo Jima, on the occasion of that picture being taken, the United States Marine Corps was about 475,000 strong. And that was when the Secretary of Navy is standing aboard a ship with Holland Mad Smith overlooking the flag raising at Suribachi, and he goes, hey, Holland, that flag raising will guarantee a United States Marine Corps for another 500 years. Less than 12 months later, less than 12 months later, uh, as, they were, as they were looking at the drawdown in World War II, the Marine Corps was viewed as redundant it was reviewed as not relevant to future security to the future security environment. And the individual on the right-hand side of the picture is, a, is an individual by the name of General Vandegrift. He was our commandant at the time. He had been the commanding general at Guadalcanal of the 1st Marine Division. And he gave what was known uh, as the bended knee speech. And on the hill, he said, hey, look, at that point, the Marine Corps had 170 years of history. He said, if in 170 years we haven't proven our relevance to the nation, we haven't proven our worth to the nation, and I'm not going to get on bended knee and, and say that the Marine Corps ought to continue on into the future. That debate continued on, and by 1949, the United States Marine Corps was about 75,000 and heading south. In fact, on the eve of, uh, of the Korean War, it was even somewhat smaller. And, of course, similar, similar things were going on in each of the other services. That particular debate ended in 1950. Next slide, please. You know, I think you all know, historically, June 1950, 11 divisions from North Korean People's Army come crashing across the 38th parallel into South Korea. The United States was engaged at a place it did not expect at a time it did not expect. What I think is instructive about that is the very best strategists our nation has potentially ever produced, to include George Marshall, oversaw the uh, drawdown in the 1940s. And their conclusion was we wouldn't fight in Asia. And certainly you remember Dean Acheson and his assessment of Asia. But, but we, we assumed at that time we wouldn't fight in Asia, that we would fight in Europe, so we were unprepared to fight in Asia. And yet, less than 30 days after the North Korean People's Army came across the 30th parallel, the United States did, in fact, decide to uh, go to war in Korea. I want to describe to you, for, and if there's any soldiers in the room, you're certainly more than familiar with this historical example, but I want to describe to you the, uh, the first engagement of U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula because I think it's instructive. The first unit was led by an individual by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Brad Smith. Brad Smith had 500 soldiers in his task force, two understrength rifle companies. He was part of the Japanese Occupation Army. He was literally called to an airfield in Japan, and his division commander, an individual by the name of Dean, said, Hey, Brad, 
I would like you to take your task force. I'd like you to go to South Korea. Move as far north to Osan as you possibly can. Find a good piece of ground. Establish a defense. God bless you. Good luck. Wish there was more I could do for you. Brad Smith took his 500 soldiers. He went to South Korea. He found a good piece of ground. Less than seven hours after making contact with the North, North Korean People's Army, less than seven hours later, he had 185 killed, wounded, or missing from his 500-man task force. What he found out when he was there was something we already knew, and when we sent him there was that his 2.36 rocket launchers were unable to stop the North Korean tanks. We had 3.5-inch rocket launchers in the inventory, but we hadn't taken the time to field those to Brad Smith. We didn't think we'd need those in the Pacific. Um, on the right is a picture of American POWs being marched through the streets. All I would tell you from this historical example is that when we talk about getting it right or getting it wrong, what we're talking about is our ability to send Americans in harm's way with the wherewithal to accomplish the mission with minimal loss of life or equipment. And the consequences of not getting it right are things like Task Force Smith. This is not an academic exercise we're in the midst of. You know, this is not theory. This is not all about strategy. It's about making sure that when we make decisions to put Americans in harm's way in the future, we do so in a way that, is, that makes sense. And, uh, and in this particular case, I think it's instructive because we didn't get it right. Next slide. In the wake of that particular uh, crisis in 1950, Congress, of course, was absolutely horrified that we had sent young Americans in harm's way without the wherewithal to accomplish the mission. And they held hearings, and they said, hey, how could this possibly have happened? How could we possibly have been unprepared for Korea? This can't happen again. And at that particular time in hearings in 1951 and 52, they, 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 they said that we needed to have a force that's most ready when the nation is least ready. We need to have a force that's in place at a high state of readiness that can buy time for decision makers. We needed to have a force that could respond to the unexpected. And because we're a maritime nation at, in 1951 and 1952, the Congress decided that that force ought to be United States Marines because United States Marines were equipped to come from the sea. And of course, it was in the wake of the Inchon landing and the demonstrations in World War II of what amphibious capabilities could do. I would, I would just remind you that in 1949, not just in 1946, you know, Omar Bradley and Lewis Johnson both said that amphibious operations were archaic and we would never do another amphibious operation again. <coughs> 60 years, uh, we felt pretty comfortable in that role. We demonstrated that the, the Congress had foresight. We responded to countless crises and contingencies to include countless crises and contingencies from the sea. And I think all the things that Congress had said uh, really came, to, came, came true. 2010, in August 2010, Secretary Gates went to San Francisco and he gave a speech. And in his speech he said, hey, I need the United States Marine Corps to tell me what you will do in the future after Operation Enduring Freedom. The nation doesn't need a second land army. The nation doesn't need a Navy police force. What will you do? Now, if you think about our history, for those who know Marines and maybe didn't understand why we have paranoia as a core competency, that paranoia as a core competency, you know, you can see it clearly in 1945 and 1946 why we might be a little bit concerned. And when Secretary Gates gave that speech, the blogosphere lit up. Uh, and and you know, I can tell you the retired Marine community uh, was very active during that period of time. And, e and even those of us on active duty looked pretty hard in the mirror to say, okay, how are we going to answer Secretary Gates' challenge? Next slide. We, uh, we locked up a number of colonels down in Quantico, Virginia for 30, uh, for, I guess 90, 120 days. Uh, as the commandant likes to say, we put all these colonels in a room, we put pizza under the door, we said, hey, don't come out until you have some good answers. But in, but in reality, Every week, as that group met, uh, we met at the three and four star level in the Marine Corps to check their progress and provide course of speed corrections along the way. And we looked at the future security environment. I don't want you to look at that very busy slide. That's not my slide, that's a joint staff slide. All I really want you to do is look at the top right and say complex, dynamic, and uncertain. Look at all the factors that may go into uh, you know, future crises and contingencies. Look at some of the global meta, meta trends that are on there. And my conclusion simply from this slide is that the world will remain a dangerous place even after we complete the drawdown in Iraq, even after we come out of Afghanistan. We are not going back to pre-9-11. This is not a return to a peacetime military. 
the world will still have numerous conflicts in the future, and frankly, from my perspective, the world will be as dangerous or more dangerous in the next decade as it has been over the past decade. Next slide. We also took a look. Again, this is all part of the analysis. This is kind of the underlying assumptions that we have made about the future of the Marine Corps. We also took a look at uh, where, our, where our economy is relying. And it's relying on what Mahan called the global commons, or, or quite simply in plain English, the highways that are the sea that move 95% of the commerce in the United States. We also took a look at where the population centers were in the world. And if I took that previous map from the Joint Staff and I overlaid it on this map, what you would see is those urban areas and those sources of conflict match quite nicely to the littoral areas of the world. Next slide. We also took a look, again, not wedded to history, but informed by history, at the numbers of amphibious operations that we had done since 1930, I mean since 1990, the numbers that have been done over the past decade. And quite frankly, we looked pretty closely at what was going on when Secretary Gates was giving his speech. Almost to the day Secretary Gates was giving his speech, we had a Marine Expeditionary Unit off the coast of Pakistan. It was conducting humanitarian assistance disaster relief almost 400 nautical miles inland. That same organization of 2,000 Marines was flying Harriers off a big deck amphibious ship in support of Marines on the ground in Afghanistan. 1,600 nautical miles to the west, that same Marine Expeditionary Unit was taken down to pirates on the MV Magellan Star. And at the very same time, a number of NCOs from that same organization were in, Jer and were in Jordan helping to prepare the Jordanians for operations in Afghanistan. All, all in the same, roughly the same day as Secretary Gates. Subsequent to Secretary Gates' speech, we, we provided relief in the typhoon uh, in the Philippines. We conducted additional assistance in Pakistan. We responded in the wake of the tsunami uh, in Japan, and we responded in the, uh, to the crisis in Libya, both with Harriers and V-22s, if you remember the F-15 Eagle pilot that was picked up by v 22 So all those things happened in the wake of Secretary Gates' speech. From all that, we also then took a look and developed some assumptions. And we said, back to that slide that Joint Staff, we said the world is going to be uncertain, it's going to be complex, it's going to be a come-as-you-are affair, uh, we're going to be dealing with a hybrid threat, and weak and failing states uh, will continue to exist. So all this, again, is just to inform our future assessment of the security environment. Next slide. I'm not going to go through this slide in great detail. If you looked at the CSIS report, this is my own personal list. I sat down on Sunday and I said, okay, what would, what would cause our nation to put boots on the ground? What would cause our nation to put boots on the ground? And these are among the things that I believe would cause our nation to put boots on the ground. And, uh, and again, the list in the, in the CSIS report is very similar. But frankly, in much of the discussion that we're having today, Many of these things are not considered, and yet when you look at history and you look at things that our national decision makers have, have decided to do, these are very much a, a key piece of why we would put boots on the ground. Next slide. This gets to what Marines uniquely contribute. And, uh, and from all of that, um, when, we, when we talk about being forward deployed, uh, being forward engaged, what Marines uniquely contribute comes from, again, that assessment of the future security environment and what the nation will need us to do. Um, I would tell you this, on a phase zero uh, type environment, as the combatant commander is dealing to shape the environment, Marines are board ship, they're able to engage with our, with our potential allies and our allies, they're able to grow capacity, they're able to develop the trust and relationships that will provide us assured access in the future. In the sticker price of that same force is, is crisis response, and in the sticker price of that same force is continuous response. And so this is kind of where we this is where we fall out, but again, what was most important is the logic that helped us get to this point. Next slide. I want to talk about uh, the size of the Marine Corps. Many people have said the Marine Corps needs to return to the post-9-11 uh, size. I would just offer to you this. The gross capacity, the aggregate capacity of the United States Marine Corps in a 186,000-man Marine Corps, which is the results of that force structure review that I described to you, is actually the same as it was pre-9-11. But what we did was we added, we added special operations forces, we added cyber forces, and most importantly, when we had uh, 172,000 Marines, we had more structure than we had Marines, and what we've adjusted is the manning so we can maintain a high state of readiness. Our units weren't properly manned in 1972, and so that's a key part of what we're doing with 186,000 Marines. Next slide. This is, uh, this is the what keeps me up at night slide. And uh, some of the things we'll talk about, some we won't. Health of the force obviously concerns me. After 10 years at war, 
Uh, we've got a number of wounded warrior issues. We've got post-traumatic stress to deal with. We've got TBI to deal with, and that's one of the things that's high on the list of my inbox. Uh, resetting the force, we've got about a $3 billion bill of equipment coming out of Afghanistan, and we need to, we need to address that. Reconstitution, uh, that's modernization. That's ensuring that we have the equipment and the training and the people to, to uh, have the capabilities needed for the future. And then maintaining a high quality force. Look at in much of the discussion and debate that's taking place, we talk about solutions of compensation and those kinds of things. What we don't talk about is the impact on the force. And I would tell you that the foundation of our success over the past 10 years, the foundation of our success has been the high quality people. Our ability to recruit and retain high quality people will determine our success in the future. And so when we have conversations about compensation, it needs to be done in that context. And finally, maintaining balance. And I'd like to go to the next slide. When we look at readiness of the force, we look at several pillars. These are, from my perspective, the pillars of readiness. Uh, high quality people, I talked about that. Current readiness, that's operations and maintenance, that's flight hours. Those are the things we typically associate with readiness, but there's far more to it than that. Capabilities and capacities versus requirements. And again, this answers the question, how do you keep from being hollow? You maintain high quality people, you maintain current readiness. You also ensure that the capabilities and capacities you have will meet the anticipated requirements of our nation. Finally, infrastructure sustainment. I've got some personal experience in this. I can remember in 1991 sitting in a meeting, uh, you know, much like the meetings I chair now, the Marine Requirements Oversight Committee. And in the, in, at the time, they were making some difficult decisions. It was the Cold War drawdown. And they said, hey, where can we find some money? And they said, hey, we can find some money in real property maintenance. That's where we'll accept some risk. And then when I went out to Camp Pendleton, California in 2001, I, I got a good appreciation for what real property maintenance risk meant when we had Marines living in barracks with asbestos carpets and lead pipes and frankly in conditions that would embarrass us. And uh, we fixed all that over the past decade, but it's what happens when you get out of balance. It's not just about current readiness, it's about the future as well. And then finally, of course, equipment modernization. Last slide. And it opened up with questions. You know, every, uh, I guess every good executive uh, has three to five priorities. Uh, this slide lists my priorities. That may uh, give you some indication of, uh, of my abilities as an executive. I've got many more than that, but this is my inbox, and I offer this, and I'll leave this slide up there because this maybe will help to help shape the questions that you might want to have. These are the issues we're grappling with as we, as we go to the future. So what I've hoped I've done just for a few minutes is, again, share with you our perspective on the future, provide with you the assumptions that we made when we developed the force structure that is in the CSI, CSIS report, uh, talked a little bit about the unique role of the United States Marine Corps, and then I think in a question and answer period we can kind of flesh that out. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Tell you what, I'll leave you with this mic. Okay. And uh, not so All right. Most of you know the way we run the drill here. You raise your hand, I'll recognize you. You wait for the microphone. Identify yourself and your affiliation, and uh, and there's about a two-second lag between the time you actually get the mic in your hand and the time our electronic signal picks up that microphone. So it's not quite real time. Uh, so recognize that if you will. So let's uh, start here. We got a couple uh, at the front table. Um, Josh, if you want to bring the mic up uh, to those. And Then you, when you're done, you can just pass the mic to him. Thank you very much for your remarks. I'm Ted Stroop, and I'm from the Association of the United States Army. Uh, this is not a hostile question. Sure. <laughs> I, I wouldn't expect it to be. Would, would you please uh, expand on the, your bullet on Pacific laydown? Sure, absolutely. absolutely. You know, the United States Marine Corps, I mean, if you, if you go back to that slide I showed you with, uh, with the world and in, uh, in our economy, the Pacific is clearly inextricably linked to our future, and, uh, and we're reliant both on, on, uh, on the Pacific from an economic perspective as well as a diplomatic perspective. Many people have kind of talked about the economy as being our number one na national security uh, challenge. Uh, you know, I think we're all smart enough to know that, that the diplomatic instrument, the military instrument, and the economic instrument are inextricably linked, and, the ec and for that reason, the Pacific is important. We have historically had a Marine Expeditionary Force uh, in the Pacific. The expectation is that we will maintain an expeditionary force in the Pacific in the future. Uh, because of our commitments in Afghanistan and Iraq over the past several years, we have drawn down our presence in the Pacific to some degree, and the intent is that we will reconstitute that capability in the future. 
There has been some agreements uh, with the Japanese uh, over the past several years to reduce our presence on Okinawa proper and expand our pre and, and therefore we will expand our presence in other areas. Uh, Guam and Australia are both locations where you can anticipate Marines to be in the future. But again, the, the footprint will be a complete Marine Expeditionary Force disaggregated throughout the Pacific, but importantly, uh, developing the capabilities to aggregate in the event of a contingency. Um, Josh, if you bring it to the microphone there. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I'm Jin Ying Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. He asked the first part of my questions, and the second part is, would you explain your idea about um, alliance capabilities and commitments? Sure. Yeah, I have, I have a bullet on the slide that talked about assumptions. It says alliance uh, capabilities and commitment. And uh, my perspective on that is there are many people who are arguing that you know, we ought to look to others uh, to pick up more of the responsibilities. And I think as we build our force uh, inside, you know, inside the Marine Corps, what we have taken a look at is uh, those alliance capabilities and commitments, and we don't think we ought to make some assumptions that some other people will be the ones to maintain freedom of the seas, as an example. Uh, we don't think some other people ought to be, we ought to be relying on others to do things. We certainly want to develop capabilities uh, of our alliances. We want to develop that trust. We think that we're uniquely capable as Marines in a forward deployed, forward engaged context to be able to do that. But at the same time, when we start assuming or uh, making assumptions about what our nation will need, uh, we ought not to be reliant on others completely. I think there's, a, there's an integration that needs to take place. There's a partnership that can take place. But there's also uh, a need not to make some assumptions that others are going to be in a better position to grow capabilities and capacities. I think if you look at the trends of our alliances right now, they are dealing with equal to or greater economic challenges, and they are making more, more uh, significant cuts in the defense capability. And so as we decide what we need to do, we need to do it in that context. I'm Gina Cavallaro from Marine Corps Times. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the drawdown and what you expect um, in the coming days, as you mentioned in your remarks, uh, what, what, what we can expect to see uh, in terms of uh, the size of the Marine Corps, how much smaller it might get, and what that will mean. Okay, I, I think, I think what, I, what I showed you is that uh, you know, after, the, after the first round, the recommendation that we made to the Secretary of Defense is that Marine Corps would be at about 186,800. Uh, and so that's, that right now, no decision has been made to, be, to go below that, and that's what we have briefed the Secretary of Defense. Uh, in order to get there, you know, we're going to have a very deliberate drawdown over the next several years. We think we can draw down about four or 5,000 a year without breaking faith with our Marines. In other words, we can do that in the normal course of events just by adjusting the meter of how many Marines we enlist and, and how many Marines we re-enlist. We will not break contracts with Marines, Marines who, who uh, right now are currently uh, staff sergeants with 14 or 15 years would still be allowed to retire, majors would still be allowed to retire those kinds of things. So we, we're, we're anticipating a very deliberate drawdown to get us to 186,800. Given the budgetary pressures, were we to go down below that, the key thing is to go back to that balanced slide I talked about and make sure that whatever size Marine Corps we have, what we're, what we're determined to do is ensure that that Marine Corps is capable and not hollow, which means that we balance our overall force structure with the equipping strategy that we have, with the operations and maintenance strategy that we have to keep it to keep a high level of training. And also that manning slide is very important. We're not going to have more structure than we can properly man. We're going to man our units at 99 percent enlisted, 95 percent officers. Back in the early 1990s, we manned our units at 90 percent officers and 93 percent enlisted. And that typically would net you somewhere in the mid-80s, mid which caused that cyclic readiness that we had with, with uh, number one, uh, units that perhaps weren't as ready as they needed to be on a moment's notice, but as importantly, in some units, we lacked the decisive engaged leadership that we should have had, and we're going to make sure we mitigate that. And that's why you see in our decisions to get to 186.8, you see that 6,000-man buyback to ensure that our units maintain that high state of readiness. So we bought that 10 percent back, if you will. Does that get at your question? Uh, John Gallinetti, Rolls-Royce. Uh, ACMAC, good to see you, sir. Thanks for your remarks. Uh, regarding the uh, $450 uh, dollar or $450 billion 
over 10 years or thereabouts. And you talked about manpower. Could you uh, further expand upon what you expect if we'll do the procurement accounts and acquisition sure. over the next uh, few years? One thing we did, you know, in, in the United States Marine Corps, uh, in the department as a whole, people is obviously one of the huge cost drivers. In the Marine Corps, it's 60 percent of our total obligation authority is dedicated towards manpower. We, we spend about 12 percent our investment account. If you were to ask the United States Army today, what do you need to maintain as a profile for investment to properly modernize, they would tell you it's at or about 20 percent. So we're investing about 11 or 12. So this gets at my point about balance. When we drew down to get to the bill, uh, to get to the level necessary to meet the, uh, the bill that we were given in the $450 billion drill, we very consciously did not touch procurement. In fact, on the contrary, what we did was we took the money that we had available. We drew down in capacity. We drew down in capacity in order to maintain balance. And what we did was we took a look at our entire inventory of, of, of equipment. And we, we mapped that back to capabilities, and we realized this is a 10-year-plus problem. So we took two fit-ups fit plus. We laid out all of our equipment. We walked across those two fit-ups. We identified the period when that equipment would have to be modernized in order to maintain a high state of readiness, and we, and we, we went ahead and, and kind of made some investment decisions based on that. So the, the, the real thing that's important to point out is that right now, were we not to have any more cuts, we just stay at the $450 billion-plus level, we stay at or about 186,000 Marines. We're confident, having looked across the Marine Air Ground Task Force, that we can maintain a proper modernization profile to stay ready over the next 12 or 15 years. We're confident in that regard. So we very much protected modernization because we have historically been underfunded. If you looked at our modernization profile, we've been at or about the $2 billion level for, ground, for, the, uh, for our ground procurement for probably two decades. And so, you know, and obviously with uh, overseas contingency funding in the war, there's been a bump in it, but that has been specifically targeted towards requirements for Iraq and Afghanistan. So, so with regard to modernization, we protected that. We believe we're in a position to address those things, not necessarily those things we want, but we're in a position to make sure that we're in a position to address the requirements of all those things that we need. Then we'll go to the uh, back table. Uh, sir, you know, recently you took part in a uh, JLTV uh, industry day. Uh, very interesting the industry, the way that went with you and the vice chief of staff of the, of the Army there also. I know in the past the Commandant has also made mention of the lessons you learned from the EFV in that procurement. I'd like, is, I'd like to find out from you, how do you felt that event went and what are you trying to do and where are you trying to go with the cooperation between uh, industry and the service? No, thanks, Dewey. That's a great question. Look, my, my perspective in the old days was that, you know, what you did was the requirements guys develop requirements, and it looked like two New York City phone books, right? So here's my requirements. And then they throw them over to Transom, and they give them to the acquisition guys. And then for five or seven years, the acquisition guys work diligently to try to get something that meets the requirements that were developed. And then they show it to senior leadership, and senior leadership steps back in horror and says, what is that? That's not what I want. They say, well, that's what you asked for. And, uh, and our, our big lesson learned as we've looked at that is, is that we believe, particularly in major procurement programs, that senior leadership needs to be decisively engaged throughout the cycle of the program. We need to understand what the requirements cost. We need to understand where the trade space is. We need to be in a position to make decisions that balance the, the operation requirement that we have and our ability to afford it. And so that's what the JLTV Day industry was all about is that, you know, I want to know personally uh, to help support the communist decision making. I want to know personally what's driving the cost of that vehicle. And I will be honest with you, and I'm, I'm pretty proud of the work that, that uh, General Corelli and I and the team have done. You know, that vehicle, if you read some articles, was at 650000 to 800000 We're down to 238000 240000 right now for that vehicle. We have a viable program in the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, and we've eliminated every single requirement that wasn't absolutely necessary to both services. And so what we really want to do with the JLTV is, is use that as a vehicle to change the culture uh, of acquisitions, and if not, the specific processes as well. One of the other things we're doing is working on a testing regime and taking a look and saying, hey, does, is how we're testing right now make absolute sense? And we're working very closely with OSD to take a look at that. But we want to know what is it that drives the cost of these programs? What is it that causes the time which is associated with the cost? What is it that causes the time to stretch out so much and, and make sure we're in a position to fix that? So I can tell you, you know, if you look at the F-35, you know, F-35B in particular, the program manager for the F-35B 
you know, it, you know, it might be Admiral Van Lett, but it's General Amos. And I can tell you that every pound that's added to that aircraft, he's sitting down asking where you're going to find that pound. He's meeting, in fact, uh, this morning, uh, he's meeting uh, with the leadership of the, uh, of the F-35 team. And we do that no less than twice a month. Soup to nuts, the entire program. Every day on a dashboard, he gets an update on that particular program. And we're doing that uh, with the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle as well. And the other key program, obviously, is our amphibious, cap is our amphibious combat vehicle, but more properly, the requirement that we have for operational and tactical ship-to-shore mobility. That's, that's kind of what we're grinding on through right now. And I can tell you what you can, what you can take from the industry day at JLTV is that's the way we're going to be doing business in the future. We believe that's the way we have to do business in the future in order to get the right result on the backside. I mean, at the end of the day, we've got limited resources. Every dollar has to count to make sure we get Marines and sailors the capabilities that they need to have. Every dollar needs to count. And the only way we're going to make sure that happens is by, by using the model that I think we're using in the JLTV right now. And again, using that model to institutionalize some changes in behavior inside the department. I mean, this is not acquisition reform in theory. We're not going to ask for six studies to be done. We're just going to engage in the process and, uh, and, and make sure that, again, it meets the time and the cost requirements that we've laid out, and as importantly, the operational requirements. We'll take a couple more. Actually, Otto, if you can wait, I'll let Frank uh, take a question here uh, from the front table. <clears throat> Good morning, General. I'm Frank Sullivan at the Stennis Center for Public Service. I just wanted to <clears throat> ask you to expand a little bit about uh, your, your the Marines' ideas about moving back to sea, uh, particularly the third and fifth things on your, your uh, view graph up there. Uh, the Navy's fleet is is gradually getting smaller, and uh, I think it's expected to continue to get smaller. And I just kind of wondered, with Marines only on amphibious ships at the present time, uh, except for the carrier squadrons, uh, how how do you see the Navy? How do you see the Marines moving back to the Navy ships uh, at sea? Uh, you know, first of all, uh, it's <coughs> true that it's true that our priority. Uh, over the last decade has been in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's a fact. Uh, we've never completely walked away from the sea throughout that entire time. I think everybody here knows we've continued to source Marine Expeditionary Units. What we have not done to the, to the same degree is maintain that Marine Expeditionary Brigade level and above capability and focused our training on that. Nor have we been working with our Navy counterparts to do that. So th the question really is twofold. Number one, is how do we b become more engaged in things amphibious? And we changed our organizational construct uh, to ensure that we'll do that. We've established one-star headquarters that will be uh, partnered with their Navy counterparts on the pier to make sure that we're thinking about how we're going to fight in the 21st century. And I, I won't go into great detail now because I know we're pressed for time, but, but we've done that conceptually. We've got, we've got fewer ships in the inventory than we need. We have an agreed-upon fiscally constrained requirement of 33. We won't get there for about four or five more years. So in the interim, uh, I think we need to take what we have, uh, use that to the best of our ability, and then we have to think more imaginatively on how to use other platforms that may be out there. And I would give you an example of the U.S. Uh, uh, Stockham, uh, which is one of our maritime preposition ships in the Pacific. We put a flight deck on that ship. We put some berthing quarters in there, and we're able to use that for enhanced maritime interdiction operations as well as phase zero shaping operations in the Pacific. As we disaggregate in the Pacific, we're going to have to take a look at things like joint high-speed vessels and other craft that will allow us uh, to meet our operational and strategic mobility requirements given the constraints that we know we're going to exist. Again, this is a 10-year problem. We, already, we, are, we don't have to wait to see what we're going to have in the future. We already kind of can lay that out, and we know we're gonna, what we're going to have in the future. We know it's going to be not enough to meet our overall operation requirements. And so what we've got to do is kind of use our brain housing group to think through different ways of using the inventory that's available right now to make up for that shortfall in amphibious ships, even as we continue to try to grow the amphibious fleet. The other thing that, uh, that I'm very encouraged about is, is Navy's leadership and, and recognition of the readiness challenges that we have had. And I think both Admiral John Harvey down in Norfolk as well as Admiral Green at, in D.C. have taken that on as a matter of priority to make sure that as we go through this drawdown, we're attentive to the maintenance and the readiness requirements of the fleet. I know they have both paid some personal attention to that, and we are starting to see some results in that regard. Take a question from Otto. Uh, sir, uh, to the points you made, one, you talked about reset. You used a figure, I think, $3 billion. That's a little lower than I, than I thought it was before. But at a forum here uh, a couple of weeks ago, Gordon Adams said that uh, 
the ground forces have been resetting all along using OCO money. So I'd okay. like to answer that. And the other one, on your modernization, you know, uh, just tick off your priorities on, on what the Corps looked at. Obviously, aviation is one of your, but, but what are your key uh, modernization priorities? Sure. Let, let, me, let me put the reset in context first. Um, we have not rotated equipment back and forth uh, into Afghanistan. The equipment has remained. We've had a principal end item rotation construct, but the equipment has remained as we've moved units back and forth. And that saved an unbelievable amount of money and time uh, in terms of strategic lift. Um, that equipment, when it comes out of Afghanistan, is going to have to be reset. The bill is lower than one you've seen in the past. I mean, the good news is at one point it was $12 billion. We have done some reset as we go. That $3 billion figure that I gave you really reflects the requirements of the equipment that's on the ground in Afghanistan and what we will need in the 24 months to 36 months after we come out of Afghanistan to get that, con that equipment back to uh, the condition it needs to be in for us to be ready. Does that answer the first, that answer the first part of your question? Okay, and, and with regard to, to uh, our procurement priorities, you know, the F-35B is, is a critical priority, but I would broaden that to marine tactical aviation. We have, we have not bought airplanes in a decade. Uh, we, we absolutely believe in the A in the Marine Air Ground Task Force. It's a critical capability for that forward deployed force. And so addressing our tactical aviation requirements writ large, the F-35 specifically is a priority. Meeting our, our tactical and operational ship to shore mobility requirements is also a priority. And then the ground tactical vehicle fleet writ large, but the joint, tact joint light tactical vehicle uh, in the near term uh, is a priority with the amphibious combat vehicle uh, replacement for the AAV be the, second, be the second in terms of time, but the number one priority in terms of importance. Your, two, your, three, your helicopter programs, and if you want to add in Osprey, your three rotary wing uh, uh, programs, where do they fit into your, into your priorities? Because they've know, been I, questioned. I, yeah, I was, I was talking about priorities for the future. The, the V-22, as you know, is, is, uh, is seven, eight, nine combat deployments right now and, and continuing to be fed in. And, and uh, we're about, I, I guess, probably a little over halfway through the buy uh, with the V-22. So we feel, we feel like we're in pretty good shape replacing our medium lift. The Yankee and Zulu are also out there. That's the uh, Cobra and Huey replacement. Those are both out there in the fleet performing extraordinarily well, and they're going to be a game changer, particularly for our Marine Expeditionary Units, so we feel pretty good about that. And the 53 Kilo program is, is, uh, is, is there. It's healthy, and, uh, and it's certainly a priority to replace the aircraft. But, uh, again, I, I gave you the top three priorities. I didn't give you the entire inventory of things that we need to do to maintain modernization, so all those programs are important to us. What I gave you was the tactical aviation the, uh, the strategic and operational lift from the sea and, uh, and our ground tactical vehicle fleet as being the top three. We're going to take one more from the table here, and then uh, I'm going to exercise the host's prerogative to ask the final question. Uh, Bill Shore of BAE Systems, sir. Um, we've mentioned F-35. We've mentioned JLTV. I'd like to know what your investment is going to be in the individual Marines, specifically lightening the load. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's that, – that I'm in the uh, what we describe as the V-ring in that regard. Target is on my chest here from uh, the Commandant's planning guidance to, li to lighten the load. I mean, we, we need to do that. Uh, if, if, and it's both an individual Marine perspective issue as well as for the Marine Air Ground Task Force as a whole. I'll give you an example. Uh, the the CH-46 weighs about 16,000 pounds. V-22 weighs about 29,000 pounds. The Humvee weighed about 7,000 pounds. You know, MRAP stay, 20, 30,000, 40,000 pounds. Um, in my career, I think it was about 2005, was the very first time we waited out a ship. It was the USS Peleliu uh, deploying from the West Coast before we actually squared and cubed it out. We usually refer to five fingerprints of lift, one of which was not weight. Uh, weight is what I describe now as a six fingerprint of lift. It's a weight and moment of issue for, for ships, and uh, it's a significant challenge. So reducing the footprint of the MAGTAF to make sure that we're heavy enough to carry today when we get to a crisis of contingency, but light enough to get there is the broad framework, and that's a critical piece, and we'll work with industry to be able to do that. I can tell you that weight is an independent variable for every piece of gear uh, that we buy. We put it through what the commandant refers to as the five micron filter as we're, as we're buying a piece of gear to make sure that, uh, that we've addressed weight uh, as an issue. So you can be sure from an industry perspective, everything we buy, we're going to be asking how much does it weigh. 
How much does it weigh? And, uh, and what we're doing is, again, two things, focusing on the weight of the individual Marine, which right now, you know, just if every, every Marine carries 83 pounds. And then depending on what his, what his particular mission is, it's additive to 83 pounds. But 83 pounds right now is the base for our individual Marines, which is obviously too much. And uh, so we're working very hard to try to do that. But, it, but as you know, uh, the challenge is meeting the protection requirements and at the same time reducing the load. And that's a tough challenge that we're working through, but we're, you know, again, every, every decision that we make, every investment decision we make, both with regard to individual gear or overall equipment for the MAGTAF is going to be, is going to be done in that context. Let me, uh, let me take the opportunity to ask a, a question based upon your comments. You mentioned uh, you arrived at Pendleton and discovered the consequences of a uh, a hiatus, if you will, in real property maintenance. And of course, you were not the only one to discover that. There's an e equally pervasive problem across much of our infrastructure basing, both here in the U.S. and around the world, and that's the problem of encroachment. And of course, Pendleton's a clear example of that. You look at how California has grown around Camp Pendleton. It puts severe constraints over your operational capability there. Same thing at Marine Corps Air Station, uh, uh, you know, Miramar is an example. There are a few places left where we haven't encroached yet, but um, but I don't hear much talk in the department about how to deal with that except on a small case-by-case -case basis, you know, kind of one endangered species at a time. Um, how does that factor into your planning, and what do you do about that going forward? Sure. One of the things we did, without, without boring you with organizational construct issues, but we just established Marine uh, Installations Command. Uh, typically, it's been a very decentralized effort. We've had regional approach to it, East Coast, West Coast, overseas. We've got a centralized Marine Installations Command now as a result of the force structure review, so we can actually take an institutional approach to all those issues that affect our bases and stations, not the least of which is training opportunities and encroachment that, that you referred to. Uh, in many ways, you know, you've got to have an institutional vision for the training areas that are required, and so we've laid that out as an institution, and then we delegate that to our subordinate commanders to go out sure and make sure that we realize that on a routine basis. What we have found uh, is, is very successful in California, and that is the partnership with our one-star headquarters at Camp Pendleton, which has been the regional director, the state and the local governments, uh, as well as the federal government. And again, I think, I think much of that is first clearly articulating what you need for training areas, and we've done that. We've got a master plan now for the 21st century that tells us what we need to have for training areas for the Marine Air Ground Task Force of the future. Once we have that, we then have to identify, you know, where we are relative to where we need to be over the next several years and a campaign plan to implement that. But, it, but there is no silver bullet to things like encroachment. I mean, you mentioned it's very much a decentralized issue. It is in many ways in the sense that it's got to be solved one issue at a time, but it's got to be solved one issue at a time in the context of a broader vision, and that's, that's, that's where we are. All right, I think we have a couple more questions here in the, uh, in the front. And if anybody else has got one, got a couple. Sir, thank you for the briefing. George Nicholson from Stratcorp. You talked about enhancing capabilities. Last month on Capitol Hill, the c commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command, was uh, Admiral McRaven, was asked by Duncan Hunter, what do you see as the role of the future for the LCS supporting? And he couldn't answer it. Uh, last month also down at Quantico, Mr. Shackley, the senior acquisition executive for the Navy, made the point that we've got to look at looking at platforms like the LCS for emerging mission areas, i.e. support the Marines, support CSARs. Uh, what, particularly now that you've gone down the direction of the Navy, I'm not downsizing to one LCS, but particularly the larger one that could put two Blackhawks on the deck, two in the hangar, and DTOS. What are the Marines doing in looking at using the, uh, the LCS? Yeah, no, we, we had a discussion at the last uh, Navy Marine Corps warfighter about the module. You know, again, there's, there's modules that are, that are conceptually available, but, but we haven't invested in those particular modules right now. And so we identified to the Navy leadership uh, the need to look at the Marine module for the LCS, and that's all competing now as we, as we go through the, the choices that have to be made in the coming days. But, but the Marine module is one we're looking at. I mean, it really is related to Mr. Sullivan's question there in terms of looking at the entire uh, capability that's available to us from a naval perspective and making sure we're using that to the, to the maximum extent possible. Let's do one final question here on the, on the right. Uh, sir, uh, Colonel Foussard from the French Air Force, <coughs> sorry for the voice. Um, first, uh, on behalf of the, uh, of the, the French Chief of Staff uh, and the French Chief of Staff of the Air Force, I'd like to assure you that the, uh, on this particular day, the, the thoughts and prayers of the French people in the military are uh, with the U.S. friends and counterparts. 
uh, the Marine Corps is really uh, uh, important for the French and the uh, British Force Armed Forces, are, uh, as they are very comparable in size and capacities, although still a little bit less than what you can provide. So uh, that's why we have uh, I've got ac actually two questions really related, um, coming back on what you said. First about the uh, access capacity and the uh, ensured access that you were talking about previously uh, in your slides. Uh, I'd like to know uh, the, uh, if, the, um, if the Marine Corps is prepared in the future to be able to provide this ensure, uh, uh, ensured access in a very heavily contest contested environment, uh, and particularly in the Pacific, where we know that little amphibious ships and, and, and ships actually will be probably under threat uh, with uh, ballistic missiles and all these kind of things that will uh, uh, deny us the ability to get closer to the shores. So that, that's a very important thing for uh, our Air Force as well and our m uh, Navy uh, in, in the French Air Force. And related to that, um, we are talking about expe expeditionary. Um, we've seen in the last decade or so that the U.S. were probably more deployable than expeditionary. And, and I, I, I'm sure you, uh, you, you see the difference in those terms, uh, um, it is important for us to understand exactly what expeditionary means in terms of readiness, but as well in terms of capacity to uh, uh, have the smaller footprint as possible, to go there, do the mission, and come back as soon as possible, rather than staying there and being stuck on the ground for years or decades. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, with regard to the, the first question, uh, operating in an anti-access area denial environment, you know, clearly uh, that's, that's a tactical challenge. Uh, I would offer that's not the first time in history we've had that tactical challenge. You could argue that the kamikaze pilot was, uh, was, was, was uh, something that, provide, that was designed to keep us from having access to an area or tactical mobility within an area. Uh, it's a tactical issue. We need a concept to deal with that. Uh, we absolutely believe uh, that in our inventory we need to have the capability to provide the nation with a short access. We can't rely from either a political or a physical perspective on the access that we would need to move the joint force into that wide range of missions that were both in the CSIS report or in my slide, we can't necessarily rely on political access or the physical access to do that. So ports, airfields, access for the joint force, enabling the joint force to go where we need to go to accomplish the mission is a critical piece. And so, yes, we, we believe we're going to do that in a contested area. It's not a World War II uh, come across the beach of Tarawa uh, scenario that we're talking about. We're talking about putting, the, you know, you know, providing uh, difficult choices for the enemy. We think that having assured access capability is a cost-imposing uh, issue for the enemy. They've got to deal with that uh, from a uh, from a resource investment perspective. It's an operational challenge for the enemy because they've got to figure out how to deal with it. And at the end of the day, this is about putting the enemy on the horns of a dilemma and being at the time and place that you're choosing and creating tactical and operational challenges for the enemy so that you can assure yourself access into an area. That's clearly not just a Marine Corps problem. It's a joint force problem. And, uh, and I think you've probably heard about the concept of air-sea battle, and that's, that's a concept subordinate to the overall joint operational access concept that will help us to, uh, to, provide, to assure access into an area so that the in order to, of course, of access is to put boots on the ground. Uh, with, with regard to the second issue with expeditionary, since we're, we're pretty short on time, I would just tell you this. I mean, from our perspective, it's the ability to operate in an austere environment uh, without reliance on host nation infrastructure. So when you come, it's again, go back to that, that word of come as you are, and you can provide yourself with the fuel, the water, the chow necessary to accomplish the ammunition necessary to accomplish the mission for a period of time. And our units are designed to do that. That's, that's the strength of the sea base, is the ability not to be reliant on a host nation's infrastructure when accomplishing the mission. General Dunford, I want to, on behalf of uh, John Hamry, our CEO, and, and CSIS, I want to thank you very much for being here with us this morning. I want to thank you for sharing your uh, comments. Um, it's, it's, many of us believe that, in fact, we haven't seen the bottom yet of budget reductions, and that uh, notwithstanding the position that the uh, Defense Department has taken, that this is as far as we can cut. We all know that the pressures will remain for a long time. It's gratifying to know that we're still going to have a balanced Marine Corps when that comes around. Um, in a previous drawdown, one of your predecessors uh, told me in response to uh, a plan for reducing the amount of ammunition that the Marines had to carry uh, when they were deploying, he said, uh, I said, well, how are you going to accommodate that? He says, we just won't miss as often. 
Um, so with that kind of an attitude, if you will, uh, uh, I think we can look forward to a, a good, balanced future. I want to uh, thank again uh, Rolls-Royce for their sponsorship for this forum. Uh, we're going to take a short reconfiguration break, but before that, please join me in a round of applause for General Dunford. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take about a five minute break uh, uh, in place and then if you could return to your seats uh, shortly thereafter, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. good.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you could uh, return to your seats and if I could have the panelists uh, report up here to the stage, I would be very grateful. Thank you. Okay, let's get ready. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to begin. If you could take your seats. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining us. My name is Nate Fryer. I'm a senior fellow here at CSIS, as well as a uh, visiting researcher at the U.S. Army War College's Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute. I'd like to uh, take another opportunity to thank uh, General Dunford for his remarks today. I think they set our, our, our discussion for this morning up very well. Um, what we decided to do, we've had General Dunford on the schedule for quite some time, and we decided it would be a perfect opportunity for yet another conversation about the future of U.S. ground forces going forward in the aftermath of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is, as you may or may not know, this is the second uh, of two panels we've had on this subject. The first was the release, the release event we had for the report U.S. ground forces through 2020 that was released on October 13th and, and the panel as well was on October 13th. We think this is an exceedingly important topic, especially given the increasing pressure to limit future defense spending, limit the appetite within the United States national security community for extended foreign commitments, and also extend advantages, U.S. defense advantages in air, sea, space, and cyber capabilities going forward. I'm not going to mon monopolize the time up here and, and, and do a lot of setup, but let me just, do set, just, just identify a few points of context. As DOD uh, goes forward and considers its strategic choices, uh, to borrow um, a, a term of art from the, the previous, one of our previous secretaries of defense, it faces a number of known knowns and a number of known unknowns. Uh, the known knowns um, are that two wars are ending, China is rising as a regional uh, and potentially global power, Iran is attempting to exert its influence in its region by expanding its capabilities, defense resources are declining, or at least plateauing, and allied capabilities are certainly declining in real terms. DOD also faces a number of known unknowns. Um, among them are the trajectory of the so-called Arab Spring, the stability of a range of key strategic states around the world, the security of weapons of mass destruction arsenals in, uh, in a number of states, and assured access to and use of the global commons, key geography, and important strategic infrastructure. Both the, known unknown, both the known knowns and the known unknowns have implications for ground forces, that is Army, Marine, and Special Operations Forces. I've asked the panel to consider three questions uh, given this context. First, how do current trends in defense strategy comport to their view of the strategic environment? Second, what are the key ground force priorities given their views? And finally, where can the United States accept, accept uh, increased risk and in ground force capabilities going forward. We're joined by a very distinguished panel. From left to right, uh, Lieutenant General Robert Blackman um, concluded a uh, distinguished career in the United States Marine Corps, a 37 year distinguished career in the United States Marine Corps, during which he held senior positions as U.S. Marine Corps Forces Command Commander, U.S. Marine Corps uh, Forces Europe Commander, U.S. Marine Corps Forces South Commander and U.S. Fleet Marine Forces Europe Commander. Next to uh, 
uh, General Blackman is Mr. Timothy Bonds. Tim Bonds is Vice President and Director of RAND's Army Research Division, the Arroyo Center, as many of you are probably aware of. And Mr. Bonds has served in a variety of research and management roles since joining RAND in 1993. To Mr. Bonds' left is Mr. Thomas Donnelly. Many of you are familiar with Tom's work. Tom is a Defense and Security Policy Analyst and is Director of the uh, American Enterprise Institute Center for Defense Studies. He's co-author with Frederick uh, Kagan of Lessons for a Long War and Ground Truth, the Future of U.S. Land Power, which came out in 2008. And finally, to Tom's left, is Mr. Frank Hoffman. Frank serves at the National Defense University as a senior research fellow with the Institute for National Security Studies, and he directs the NDU Press. He's lectured extensively and published over 100 articles, as well as a book, Decisive Force, The New American Way of War. So please, would you, uh, with me, welcome our panelists today. General Black. Good morning, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I, I really have uh, five or so points that I'd like to make that uh, pertain to the questions um, that, that have been asked. Um, and, and first, let me say that the, the ground forces study uh, that was just referenced uh, I think is superb. Um, I mean, through the years, as was said, I spent 37 years on, on active duty. Toward the end of that, I, I uh, was forced in some instances to read studies like that. Uh, but the reality is um, that's perhaps the best piece of work uh, along those lines that, uh, that I've ever had the opportunity to, uh, to read. Um, I mean, some of them, you know, it's, it's uh, as the kids say, it's, uh, you know, written by Captain Obvious. Um, but uh, I thought there was a, a tremendous amount of uh, thought um, and experience that, that went into that study. Um, the study mentions that um, America's conception of its natural is advantage is the ability to effectively leverage advanced technology to its benefit. Um, I, I, I'm sure that the study captured that correctly, but I think it is absolutely wrong. I think America's advantage in warfare are American servicemen and servicewomen. Um, they are intelligent. They are uh, well-led, they are well-trained, they're imaginative, they're a product of our democracy. Uh, they're able to make decisions when decisions need to be made. Um, and not only are they good leaders when they need to lead, but they're good followers when they need to follow. And, and in my opinion, that's the extraordinary advantage that America has. And, uh, and in particular, as that pertains to, to ground forces. Um, ground forces are kind of the, uh, the ultimate multi-role weapon system. You know, we talk about the F-16, that's a wonderful multi-role platform, or the Arleigh Burke destroyer, but those multi-roles are in the upper ends of, of warfare. Uh, ground forces, as I said, are the ultimate multi-role weapon system. You can reestat ground forces from the lowest end of, of the spectrum of warfare to the very highest very, very quickly, almost overnight. A little tweak in training, perhaps some, some changes in equipment, um, and, and I think the inherent flexibility um, that ground forces have in terms of responding and adapting very quickly uh, make them uh, uniquely uh, important to our national defense. Um, ground forces um, address two of the most powerful emotions that, that people have. And we don't talk about it much. Um, fear and hope. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to understand how, how powerful those emotions are. Ground forces 
work with people eye to eye. They generate fear. Think about what makes you afraid. Think about, I mean, really and truly, what, what are you afraid of? Oh, I don't mean, you know, falling down and breaking your leg or getting in an automobile accident, but what are you really afraid of? What are you afraid of when you're walking through a parking garage at night or, you know, you read about in the newspaper some kind of a home break-in or a carjacking? You're afraid of somebody. And ground forces are that somebody, somebody that can make eye contact uh, with the people and generate that emotion of fear. But they can also generate that emotion of hope. Platforms don't generate hope. People do. And, and that, to me, is the great strength of, of ground forces, is their ability to interact with people and, and give them hope. Um, a few years ago, I led the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, effort in, for tsunami relief in the Indian Ocean Basin. And, and it was the first time that I really began to understand that emotion of hope and, on the other side, hopelessness. Um, and and I, will t I am here to tell you, I, in, in Indonesia in particular, in, in Banda Aceh, um, we arrived on an absolutely hopeless situation. And, and there's no piece of steel, no computer chip that, that can generate hope in people. Other people generate hope through their, through their actions and their demeanor. And that's what ground forces bring. Um, last, um, another statement that was made in the study was many believe the era of large-scale conventional wars has passed. I, I, I mean, clearly, you know, how do you, you know, where does that come from? You know, since, since the mid-1950s, we've been saying that the problem in Korea was going to be over in 10 years. Um, and we have. I mean, every year it's, it's 10 more years, and it's still there today. So I guess if you keep your fingers crossed in 2021, 2022, we'll be, we'll be good there. Um, I think what those people are really talking about is, you know, their wish, it's wishful thinking, because what they really want is immaculate warfare. They, they don't want men and women to engage men and women face to face. Um, and I think, I think you have to understand that in order to be successful in warfare, you have to be a part of the operating environment. You have to be woven into the operating environment. You have to be integral to, to what's happening on, in the, uh, happening on the ground, and obviously only ground forces can do that. But I think the whole concept of immaculate warfare is really our collective concern with casualties. I think we want to avoid casualties at all, all costs. I think we've backed into this idea of of technology and immaculate warfare because, because of our fear of, of casualties. And I think Congress leads that charge in terms of, of avoiding casualties. One of the most remarkable things I've seen in my lifetime is the procurement of the MRAP. Um, I mean, it, it, is, it is absolutely a remarkable effort. No other piece of hardware or, or weapon system that, that I could even dream of um, would fit into that category. Why? Because it was protecting American lives. It was avoiding casualties, and it did. It saved an extraordinary number of lives and still does today. Um, but pick another piece of hardware and get, get the same uh, support from Congress and the, and, and the same fast track through the system. It, it doesn't exist. And so I think we have to recognize that in warfare, if we're going to be successful, unfortunately, uh, there are going to be some casualties. And you can't make it any other way. And regrettably, the ground forces bear the brunt of those casualties. Always have and always will. 
Um, and, and I think we just need to recognize that, that that can't be avoided. That's all I have. Thanks. Great. Thank you, sir. Good morning. My name is Tim Bonds. I'm delighted to be here with you today. Thanks for this opportunity to speak. Um, I would like to follow on uh, with some of General Blackman's com uh, comments. I'm in broad agreement with them, and I think I'd like to touch on some of them as I go forward. Let me remind the audience what the three questions were uh, we were asked to uh, address. The first was, how well uh, do trends and defense strategy comport with future threats and associated demands for forces? Number two, what should we design ground forces to do? And I think General Blackman um, touched on many of those things. Number three, how much ground ca capability is enough? That is, where and in what ways should we be willing to assume ground force risk? And again, I think General Blackman's comments helped to shape that. Let me take these questions in turn. On the first, um, how well do trends and defense strategy comport with future threats? I think that's unclear. Discussions of strategy seem to be divided between two different things, two different opposing approaches, if you will. On the one hand, balanced approaches to a range of important challenges and threats, such as those approaches described in the National Security Strategy, the QDR report, and the National Military Strategy, and on the other hand, one-dimensional approaches, which tend to focus on one challenge or threat, and often prescribe a narrow range of military capabilities to deal with that challenge or threat. Not only is the balanced approach better, it's essential to our security. A balanced approach addresses our highest security priorities and obligations, including, um, among the documents I mentioned, the defense of the U.S. homeland and military support to civil authorities, maintaining access to key regions, routes, and resources, defeating criminal, insurgent, and terrorist networks, countering the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, most especially nuclear weapons, defending U.S. allies, friends, and interests from attack, uh, including deterring threats with nuclear weapons and deterring and defeating conventional attack, and finally, securing important commons and domains, including cyberspace. Now, I couldn't write quite as quickly as General Dunford was going through his slides, but I saw those same themes on at least one of his slides. Second point, given these security priorities, what should we design ground forces to do? First of all, uh, the U.S. conducts joint operations, and joint operations as practiced by U.S. are team operations. So I think the right question is, how should we design ground forces, um, what should we be designing them to do as part of that team? The answer should be that ground forces contribute a, to a comprehensive set of capabilities, hedges, and options to help joint commanders achieve security objectives. I think one of the things that General Blackman pointed out in his comments is that there really is a complementarity between the things you can do with forces on the ground, Army, um, Marines, and special operators. They're difficult to do uh, strictly when one thinks about warfare in terms of platforms or concepts built around them. So let me use the missions I described a moment ago to frame some of these examples. For the defense of the U.S. homeland and military support to civil authorities, an important capability, for example, uh, would be a specialized capability like uh, Ciberni, that's uh, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive consequent management response forces. Those are the sea smurfs uh, that have been talked about in the QDR and other places. It's important to ensure that those specialized capabilities like the sea smurf exist and are ready to prevent or mitigate harms. It's also crucial to maintain capacity and general purpose active and reserve component forces. Uh, as General Blackman mentioned, these really are your full spectrum, you know, um, very adaptable assets that will help you in the case of defending the U.S. homeland or supporting civil authorities to provide the medical, communications, logistical, and other kinds of support that the nation's responders are going to need. The next mission, maintaining access to key regions, routes, and resources. Um, here, ground forces really expand the options of joint force commanders to counter or defeat anti-access forces such as high-quality air defenses, any ship missiles, and other systems. An analogy might be made to the combined special operations, air operations efforts to find and, skill, find and kill SCUDs during OIF. Future U.S. operations could expand on this concept, perhaps by combining the full range of potential airborne and air mobile capabilities with advanced air and long-range missile fires. More on those points um, in a bit. There is a key point worth emphasizing this in other missions. Adversary militaries might be able to match one or more uh, dimensions of U.S. capabilities in a given set of circumstances. However, few nations will be able to match the combination of cyber, land, air, sea, and space capabilities that the U.S. can muster. So let me coin a term here. We can talk about air-land battle, we can talk about air-sea battle. Those are useful constructs. 
But I really think that the nation should be talking about class capabilities and concepts, and that is cyber, land, air, sea, and space. It's really the combination of these things that the nation should be pursuing. I think it offers a complementary set of capabilities that no other nation can match, and together I think it really maximizes the kind of effectiveness that our military can offer. Next mission, defeat criminal insurgent and terrorist networks, JTF Horn of Africa might be an example of this, a combined joint interagency task force tasked with conducting counter-terror ops while other ground forces, Marine, uh, Army, provide enablers and quick response forces. Here's a counterfactual for you. What would these capabilities have been useful, would these capabilities have been useful if they had been available to secure some of the advanced weapons like man pads, man portable air defenses, that were lost in Libya? Reports now that up to 20,000 of these weapons may have been lost. Reports now in the press of some of them having made their way to Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian authorities have picked up some. Some others appear to have gotten a little further. Um, if we'd have had some of these capabilities available in that operation, could we have secured some of those weapons before we see them coming onto our shores or the shores of our allies? For countering the pr proliferation of WMD, most especially nuclear weapons, we have one recent example planning a mission of this type. That was the 75th Exploitation Task Force that was hastily organized and tasked with inspecting a number of sites in Iraq during the combat phase of OIF. There are some difficulties with that mission. The task took hundreds of troops, but uh, efforts to reach the sites uh, that were known at the time uh, that were suspected of having these important weapons were hampered by the lack of organic reconnaissance, transportation, force protection that the 75th Exploitation Task Force had with them. Also, they had insufficient numbers of troops to secure sites uh, once they had arrived at them or to conduct comprehensive searches. I'll try to move quickly. Um, seizing, searching, and securing suspected sites in a failed North Korea, as a different case, might require a very large ground force. It would have to be part of a larger campaign that would include security at ports, controlling movements on roads, force protection, etc. It could require tens to hundreds of thousands of troops, depending upon desired timelines, the opposition encountered, and the concurrent humanitarian operations that are almost certain to be taking place. Some of these same capabilities would be useful in defending U.S. allies, friends, and interests from attack. Uh, a minimalist approach would be to provide enablers for combined operations, including reconnaissance, intelligence, and targeting, communications, logistics, uh, theater, air, and missile defense, et cetera. A more extensive approach would be tens of hundreds of thousands of troops, uh, depending on the threat and allied capabilities, and it's useful to remember that in many cases, the Allies actually are decreasing their ground capabilities uh, even more quickly than we are contemplating doing so ourselves. Lastly, securing important commons and domains such as cyberspace. The Army's already made a large commitment here as well. Uh, U.S. Army Cyber, or Second Army, comprises 21,000 military and civilian personnel for this mission. And I might also mention that the Army's Space National uh, Missile Defense, Theater and Missile Defense Forces comprises a significant number of forces also. Finally, I'll turn to your third question. How much ground capable is enough? Where and in what ways should we be willing to assume some ground risk? For, so let me repeat a few observations that a colleague of mine, Dave Johnson, has made in his analyses of recent wars against regular adversaries. Potential adversaries know our capabilities and vulnerabilities and are adapting. They've learned something from what they've observed from us, especially over the last 10 years. Future challenges requiring joint forces that are uh, prepared for a range of adversaries, irregular state-sponsored, hybrid, and states themselves, prepared for operations in complex terrain, particularly large urban areas, with the adversary operating amongst the people, and capable of joint combined arms fire and maneuver are those forces that we need to have the kind of adaptability that I think both uh, uh, General Blackman and others have observed. In these wars, balanced ground forces are key. Um, they will include armor uh, in order to be able to um, be able to be survival against standoff fires and operate in the presence of them, dismounted infantry, uh, field artillery and air defense in order to have success against fully competent adversaries. And scale matters. It takes troops to comp control complex terrain in large areas and to deal with large populations. For these reasons, the current ground forces could be very busy preparing for the tasks that I've outlined above. However, the DOD must uh, inevitably plan for future missions in the presence of known budget cuts and potential uh, future cuts. So the question should be, how might those budget cuts be taken across the joint force in ways that minimize risk to overall U.S. national security. For that question, the DOD should consider the following as it makes these decisions. Missions conducted will have different scope and scale of capability needs and readiness requirements. Some will be highly specialized, for instance, countering anti-access forces. Some potentially large in scale, for instance, countering the proliferation operations in a failed nuclear state, like a collapsed North Korea. 
Uh, and response commitments uh, and requirements will vary with the situation at hand. Each service, then, should be sized, trained, and equipped to maximize the overall ability of the joint force to meet priority security obligations. For instance, the end strength and structure of each service should be carefully examined in terms of day-to-day op-tempo and surge requirements. Um, we need to think about uh, what the role of the reserve components will be. We need to develop mechanisms to make reduced number of troops cover scope and scale of mission demands. Uh, but in the final analysis, I'd like to turn finally to, I think, the key point that General Blackman made. In the final analysis, what's really crucial uh, in the case of the Army is to develop soldiers with really superb skills. Because our forces are small in overall size compared to previous eras, compared to f potential future competitors, and our global security responsibilities that really span the full spectrum of, of operations, of warfare, if you will, uh, we need very high quality troops uh, that will have superb technical capabilities, the ability to think and reach decisions about complex situations that may be out of areas that they have trained, or independent of senior officers. Oftentimes, the Army and Marine Corps uh, have found um, small groups of soldiers and Marines far away from higher echelons of command. They need to be able to make those decisions rapidly and superbly well. This applies to both officers and enlisted soldiers, and it takes a very long time uh, to develop this. These are very long lead capabilities in order to have um, that, that competent force um, that can decide um, you know, how to deal with many, uh, very complex situations in very different uh, in difficult circumstances. With that, I'd like to turn it back over. Great. Thanks. Uh, Tom. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be as efficient uh, as Tim, but <laughs> uh, 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 take a, a tad slower. Um, um, my sermon uh, begins with a reading from Scripture, by which I mean Clausewitz, uh, and that uh, uh, the reading I like to start with is uh, Clausewitz's dictum about determining the nature uh, of the conflict, the first and critical uh, act of statesmanship and strategy. So figuring out what we want our ground forces to do and what we want our military more broadly to do uh, is, is probably a good place to start this conversation rather than, uh, and I will get through to the other questions. Uh, but my view would be that trends, which these days are more often associated with uh, twittering or tweeting uh, than, than strategy making, and strategy are, are becoming fundamentally different things. Successful strategies are long-term strategies. And the United States has had a very successful long-term strategy since the end of World War II. And I think it ought to be the rebuttable proposition that we're not going to deviate from that, uh, although there's obviously a lot of conversation and suggestion that we now do so. The fundamental goals of the United States have not changed. Uh, both the General and Tim suggested, I think, uh, and General Dunford also um, uh, made reference to this, and there's pretty broad uh, agreement that the United States wants to be able to uh, secure and exploit both for commercial and strategic reasons the global commons, to use the collective noun, the seas, the skies, space, and now uh, cyberspace, but also wants a favorable balance of power uh, across Eurasia, basically Western Europe, uh, uh, East Asia, Maritime East Asia, where the United States has been a global power, or the dominant power, pardon me, since the end of World War II, and along the southern rim, which initially, uh, or you know, back when CENTCOM was founded, uh, was centered upon the Persian Gulf, but I would argue is now expanding to include uh, South Asia uh, as well. So I, I'm going to catch my further remarks. Those are what I see as the enduring strategy and the more recent trends uh, in American strategy. And again, I'm not going to suggest that we alter our strategy, uh, uh, but the question before us is whether we can better allocate the resources that we have uh, to maintain uh, a workable approach to that global strategy. Again, I think it is a global whole, not just an aggregation of individual uh, piece parts. And our military approach to, the, to all these problems uh, has been pretty adaptable, however. Uh, there's a, a recent uh, rise uh, among people like Frank and others to a return to an offshore balancing posture. Uh, we have sometimes adopted that posture, but uh, particularly uh, in Europe and in uh, 
continental uh, East Asia, uh, we've come ashore and more, uh, uh, you know, significantly and what's been the steady diet for American land forces for the past 30 years has been an increasingly onshore posture across the greater Middle East. Uh, we are stepping back from that, certainly uh, beginning uh, January 1st and possibly uh, beyond that. But I would question whether that's really a durable trend, whether we can achieve the outcome that we want in that region, and that's been pretty broadly consistent, by retreating to an offshore posture. The thing, we did not want to come ashore in the first place. Uh, we were dragged kicking and screaming over, again, three decades. Uh, but that trend is pretty uh, remarkable as well, again, particularly when one thinks about ground forces. And so what are the most likely threats that re require large-scale force structure uh, or have large-scale force structure implications uh, uh, among those uh, uh, long-term uh, strategic interests of the United States? Well, I, I would say that the, the real canonical scenarios and the new canonical scenarios that we need to be thinking are what about to do about nuclear Iran, seriously what to do about uh, Pakistan that internally collapses and, of course, how to balance uh, China or geopolitically contain China, not uh, contain it uh, in any economic or cultural sense, but by containment I mean restricting China's ability uh, to change the course of history through the application of military force either through intimidation or direct uh, attack. Now the China question uh, uh, is, is the last one I'll uh, turn to. But I want to uh, talk a bit about uh, the second question, which I take to be a question about the character of the ground forces. Uh, and Tim was quite right. We do now fight uh, in a pretty uh, joint way. And I would think that it's time to actually rethink that. If we're going to essentially spread less butter across the same global toast uh, in the future, um, doing it uh, jointly may not be the most effective nor the most efficient way to do so. Jointness is a product of the late Cold War when all the services were concentrated on a particular enemy and a particular conflict that we thought that we understood. Our experience over the last uh, 10 years in particular is that we can do long-running irregular conflicts in a joint way, but whether that was the cheapest or the most effective way to do it I think is a question that needs to be revisited. It's really amazing that we can fly carrier air cap uh, over northern Iraq or northern Afghanistan uh, from the Red Sea or the Persian Gulf, but it's pretty darn expensive to do it that way. Are there other ways to provide fire support, essentially, and reconnaissance to uh, uh, dispersed land forces? And is that something that should be reconsolidated uh, within a single service structure? I want to talk a bit about the Army and about the Marine Corps uh, and, and about uh, uh, the larger, long-running conflict in the Middle East of which we've been a part and which Iran and Pakistan may be the most stressful uh, campaign scenarios that, that one can imagine. I, I would advance that the Army, you know, just what we have an Army for is sustaining long-term conflicts or, or winning long-running conflicts. It's our long war force. Now, the Army hasn't fully adapted to this. They've adapted in many ways, but the temptation is now going to be to turn away from that. Uh, and even if there's, you know, direction from higher authority to do so, I'm not sure that's a wise thing to do and that Army leadership uh, needs to be thinking uh, about uh, what the nation will ask it, to, was most likely to ask it to do over the long haul. And there are things that can be done to better uh, uh, be able to sustain a substantial presence ashore in the Middle East. Most of these, I think, have to do with force structure rather than platforms or systems. Yeah, there are many advantages to the current uh, brigade combat team structure, but they're almost entirely optimized for force generation and rotation rather than sustaining a long-term presence. We ought to be thinking about things like field armies. I think we ought to have more core headquarters. 
I would rather have fewer brigade but more sustained brigades. No brigade has deployed to any of these conflicts without an extra dollop of enablers that often adds up to about 30 or 40 percent of the book and strength of a BCT. So we took those savings, those personnel savings and those force structure savings in the expectation uh, that technological transformation would make the battlefield transparent. And our experience for a long time refutes that and that we've had to fight for information rather than simply collect it through technical means. We've had to occupy territory. We haven't been in a lot of big gunfights, but we've had to stay where we go to achieve the political change that we want, which is the purpose of the exercise. I think we need to adapt to that more institutionally. And finally, while talking about the institution of the Army, I worry that the Title X institution of the Army the training and thinking uh, parts of the Army have been bill payers for scrambling to put forces into the field. I think that's been neglected and we uh, failed to rebuild those and in fact overbuild those uh, by recent standards, although they look like overhead and tail in the canonical tooth to tail con construct. Uh, but uh, now's the time uh, to put those things back together and actually, again, overbuild uh, and rebuild things like the SAMS program or even maybe uh, constructing an analog at the war college level. And that's more important than equipment modernization, in my judgment. The people are more important. And uh, it's time also to, I think, fundamentally rethink the role of the Marine Corps. Marine Corps has been an all-purpose force that's done a lot of different things. But having to use it in a long-running irregular warfare uh, situation uh, over the last 10 years is not the best use of the Marine Corps and it's not the most effective use of land forces in those wars. This is, again, not a knock on the Marines. I think the Marines would actually like to get back to doing shipboard Marine things. Uh, but, but to do that uh, in a modern combat environment requires continued modernization and investment. It's possible, it's okay to have let the EFV go, maybe, but to lose the F-35B uh, would really, I think, collapse the entire structure of the Marine Corps. They'd be essentially ship-borne uh, air mobile infantry at that point, and they would become uh, a consumer of other people's firepower and mobility rather than a producer of firepower and mobility. I also think there's a great opportunity to expand the role of the Marine Corps in this regard. An amphib with 30 stealthy jump jets may be more productive and capable in many scenarios than a large deck carrier with 60 or so F-18s. That's something that we should think about. So when you're talking about the structure of the Marine Corps, you also have to obviously think what the Navy looks like. So if the Navy is not going to buy uh, uh, appropriate aircraft or air vehicles uh, to maintain the viability of its carriers, which it's got another 50 years worth of investment already sunk in, those assets are not going to be, those will genuinely be wasting assets. And so uh, the Marine Corps also needs to be cocking an eye in the direction of um, uh, operating in the anti-access environment, not just in uh, the Far East, but, but elsewhere. Uh, if you had to fight Libya again, but again, maybe had two large deck amphibs worth of uh, F-35s available, how would that have changed the campaign? How would it have changed the outcome? Uh, particularly if you had essentially a joint sea-based force. Turning finally to the question of how much. Uh, I can't do anything uh, other than uh, uh, attack with two up, one back, and one in reserve. Uh, consequently, applying that on the grand strategic level uh, and to land forces, I think it's necessary to have um, uh, basically a, a two-station land force presence in the Middle East. Call them Iraq and Afghanistan just for, uh, just for argument's sake. That represent not just a continued stabilization of those countries, uh, but essentially uh, platforms, uh, you know, reconnaissance and surveillance units uh, that are forward uh, deployed and provide for the onward movement for other forces 
if things get out of hand. Uh, likewise, uh, in the Pacific or at sea, uh, keeping at least two uh, marine units at sea at any time strikes me as an absolute minimum uh, of capability. Uh, and again, I would want to try to find a way to get the Marines out of obligations in the Middle East and to put them at sea and more present, particularly in places like the South China Sea, but in maritime uh, environments or more maritime environments uh, where their unique capabilities uh, reward the investment. The one back, uh, uh, I think, needs to be con conceived of in terms of a regime change force. Regime change is a term that nobody likes to talk about uh, very much anymore, uh, but it has been an American habit for a, a long, long time. And if we really want to affect geopolitical change, it remains uh, both the elemental a measure of deterrence and of victory in times of conflict. And finally, the in reserve element. Uh, we have not thought very much about keeping a strategic reserve in terms of the uh, National Guard and reserve components for a long, long time. They've been sucked into the deployment conveyor belt, becoming an operational reserve uh, that in many ways is hardly different from the pace uh, of people who are in active units. Now, that makes them much, much better than anybody anticipated they would be, but it does mean the cupboard's bare if uh, we, uh, we have things that we haven't planned for. And you have to say that in many ways, we have not been able to fight two simultaneous campaigns over the last 10 years. We've fought Iraq and Afghanistan essentially sequentially, and we couldn't both surge in Iraq and Afghanistan and sustain it at the same time. So that, uh, again, elemental measure of uh, a global power or a predominant regional power uh, is something that we continue to need to make the building block when we ask how much is enough. Here endeth the lesson. Great. Thank you very much, Tom. Frank? Thank you very much. I've got to issue a caveat. I'm working for the Department of Defense. I'm not speaking for Mr. Panetta. I'm not speaking for NDU or any of my other prior appointees or appointments. Boy, are they glad of that. And they're very glad of that. And it'll be very evident for I'm not speaking probably for some people in the Navy or other places. I'd just like to start to say how annoyed I am at what passes for current strategic thinking in town. Uh, um, I'm just, I guess I'm not amazed because I've been in town for 25 years and, and seen the sine waves over time. But uh, it, it is amazing how, how quickly amnesia has set in. And you know, I, I think I would characterize it as something we suffer from in Washington right now is strategic amnesia. We're overlooking the entire last decade and every possible, I think, strategic lesson one can learn about what happened. What many people want to learn from the last decade is, boy, we don't want to do that again. And I, don't, I think that's the wrong lesson. We need to understand how we got into that in the first place. Some of it was failures in thinking about the supreme judgment of the character of war, which gets made between, in Clausewitz's words, both the statesman and the commander, uh, which is an interesting policy, strategy, development, interchange that we seem to have trouble doing with in this country. But, uh, I think we're overlooking the true lessons we need to understand that we're not very good at predicting the future. Uh, we should be really humble about that. We don't imagine the character of our uh, future scenarios very well or the character of our adversaries, and we should take that into account. Uh, it ought to be something very humble about it. Uh, part of this amnesia is what I call repeating the past. Uh, we had this fatuation with concepts in the past and what I call TLAs, and some of these will be familiar to people in the audience, RDO. N C W R M A and our, our real favorite E B O. And so, having learned this over the last 10 years, what have we done? We've created another TLA, another three letter acronym, and it's called ASB. Uh, I hope, hope we have more success intellectually, capability wise, with ASB than we've had with the other ones. Um, I'm not knocking ASB. I actually think air-sea battle is a very useful construct. It's great. It's necessary. It is not sufficient. Gets me into my second problem, what I call strategic oversight. We are infatuated with what we call the anti-access threat. Uh, if you read the QDR, the fourth out of the six major critical challenges of the future is deterring aggression in anti-access environments. It's a valid point. It's a growing, emerging challenge at the strategic and operational level. 
You read the Joe that General Mattis developed and uh, the Chairman's capstone concept. They both deal with, with addressing this with a lot of focus on what I consider to be the outer half of the problem, the ASB problem, the emerging high-tech range and lethality and precision of an anti-access threat. Defeating that threat it has actually has a purpose, and that's to get the ground force in to deal with the air denial threat. The adversary apparently has something he values that he is wanting to defend and hold us at risk uh, by pushing us out. Obviously, then we need probably to correspond to understanding that the opponent is worried about our ability to deflect that anti-access uh, environment and to operate effectively inside his, uh, his operating space. There's something he values, there's something he's risk. We've gotten infatuated with the emerging long-range high-tech problem of the anti-access thing. We forgot about the current extant threats that we already face inside of a place like Iran or Af Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, so we need to understand the whole problem. Uh, the air, air defense challenge exists today. It's also getting worse. Uh, things like the MRAP were produced to, to deal with that. It's current, it's deadly, it's purposeful, and we need to worry just about as much as that as we do the outer half of the problem that ASB is uh, focused on. I'm going to focus my comments a little bit narrowly. Uh, Tom and I can uh, address some issues about land forces in the 21st century, perhaps in the Q&A, but I think Tom and I actually have a lot in common in terms, I think, of the capability of the force fully echo your comments on the F-35B uh, and, and the Marine Corps at sea where the investment is high, but I think the payoffs is, is worth it. Uh, I think the only difference between Tom and I, I think we have the same capacity and the same capabilities desired. Just, it's just how you posture that force. I'm in favor of maximizing our freedom of action politically because we can't predict where the next crisis is going to be. So I don't want a lot of things, you know, fixed at risk in places where they're already inside the enemy's missile fans. I don't want to infringe upon other people's uh, sensitivities and political vulnerabilities. I don't want a lot of fixed vulnerable forces that are tied down to one situation. I want to be able to move around the world and deal with things. And so I think the difference between Tom and I is just one of uh, posture. I think we're both uh, in favor of an effective ground force in its totality. Uh, I want to reference to the CSI report, which I would give an excellent grade to if I was grading over at NDU. Um, but also if I was the editor of, uh, of any journals at NDU, which I think I am, uh, I wouldn't give it an outstanding grade. I'm, I might send it back to, uh, to the authors and ask for just a little bit more work. It's got an outstanding point about forcible entry, which I strongly concur in, and I'd like to see the why and the rationale for why retaining or <coughs> preserving a forcible entry capability is in the nation's strategic interest in the 21st century, not necessarily in the past. So I'm going to focus my comments on, on that today. Uh, the why, so we can extrapolate why we're being asked to make this, this investment. My remarks will be really short, but if you want to see the fuller extended version, the lead article in the current Marine Corps uh, Gazette of December of this year has got a wonderfully strategically oriented article, which I commend your attention. I have no idea who the author of that piece is. For, from my perspective, there's at least five strategic advantages of having a flexible force or entry capability, you know, gives the nation. And General Dunford, you know, stressed that point today, but I want to kind of riff off that a little bit. And the very first one is, is that we need to have and we need to be able to project a credible deterrent against aggression around the world. And I think a forceful entry, a maneuverable at sea capability, call it offshore, call it over the horizon, call it inside the brown water, whatever you want, I, th I think provides that. There's another report from another think tank in town uh, that produced a report, I think, last month that suggested that amphib ships could be done away with because we haven't used them in 60 years. And I know the general thrust of that comment is, you know, we haven't done an Inchon or a Tower or a Regime, and we haven't lost 3,000 people in one afternoon crossing a bloody beach someplace. I realize that. But I also realize that we've used uh, amphibious operations 200 times since the Cold War and 50 times since 9-11 for various things, including missions that General Blackman's executed and led at the JTF level. And also know that we have conducted amphibious assaults deep into hostile territory with Task Force 58 when General Mattis was a Brigadier General with two Mews at sea that came together and did something. They didn't cross a beach and, and lose 3,000 people in a day. They, they avoided the enemy's strength and went in deep and seized something that the uh, National Command Authority told them to go take. Uh, so we used this before. I, I think it's a, a useful capability. Uh, I disagree with the idea that we haven't used it in 60 years, but I know we haven't used it in the sense. But if you follow that logic to its... Uh, extreme perhaps, uh, we'd get rid of ICBMs and we'd get rid of a lot of nuclear subs because we haven't sunk any subs lately and we haven't fired off any ICBMs. You know, the point is we have certain capabilities because they change state behavior. They deter or stop somebody from doing something. And I think that's why we have ICBMs and I think ICBMs have obviously been de facto very effective because we haven't had to use them. 
And I'd argue that our, our uh, credible strategic deterrent of uh, anti-aggression with, with forceful entry capability has obviously been just as successful for the same logic of 60 years of not having to use it, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't invest in it. In fact, since we use it so many times, it's basically paid for itself with engagement, uh, with deterrence and kinds of things. It, it doesn't have to necessarily justify itself uh, on, on its usage level. The second reason is I, th I, I do think we need to be able to negate an enemy's anti-access and air denial capability, and that's what this forceful entry capability gives you. In sync with the Navy, the ability to get inside somebody's envelope, negate the envelope, deflect it, degrade it, obfuscate it, but get inside and put something at risk that that adversary holds, holds dear. And stand off further and further and further away may not be able to do that. You know, that's, that's a hope for a strategy. It's not a true strategy in my view. And that need to deal with both the anti-access and the air denial. Access, anti-access is just somebody who's trying to keep you out. Uh, you can bring that down so you can get in, but then you also need to be effective inside. And many people have a very effective air denial capability of denying your freedom maneuver inside their ground space. And we need to be just as effective against the air denial threat as we now think of ourselves in the anti-access. And the third and the fourth reasons are somewhat re related. I think you need to think about imposing costs on people. And when you have the capability of taking something away, blowing it up is one thing, but seizing it, holding it, uh, you're forcing somebody to have to defend it, and forcing it to, to defend it in different ways. Defend it from strike, defend it from maneuver, creates you know, dilemmas for the individual, and he's got to expend resources to defend that. I think we're doing a wonderful job with China right now. They spend all kinds of money on anti-access, as are the Iranians. And I think I, we want them to uh, continue to spend that money, hopefully waste it. The second and related is, is diluting uh, an adversary's investment portfolio. If all the enemy has to do is deal with your tea lamps coming from a thousand miles away, and that's all he needs to focus all his defensive uh, shield issues on, he might find a way to do that. If all he has to do is deal with a helicopter assault from, from the deck of an amphib, and he only has to worry about helo assaults, he'll focus all his money into man pads or something that takes down helicopters. He might actually get that. If all the enemy has to do is a short-legged JSF that is allegedly stealthy today, but may not be in 10 or 20 years, that that's all the enemy has to to worry about, and he gets to focus all his money just on that one little problem, you haven't complicated it for him, he might be successful at that. And if he is successful, then you have, to, you have to report yourself to the President at some point in time. You've denied him a range of options, and you have generated no dynamics and no dilemmas for the adversary whatsoever, and the President has an empty quiver. Uh, finally, you know, at the end of the day, you, know, you want to be able to go to the President, or you want to be a Joint Force Commander, and you want to be able to assure access. You want to hope for it. You don't want to Hope that somebody gives you permission to come into a third-party country. You don't want to have all the infringements, the costs, or the political vulnerabilities of going into a third party and then coming into a, a more expected route. You want to assure access at a time and place of our choice, not somebody else's. So those are five reasons that I would, I think, uh, access and forceful entry are important. And, and hopefully, if CSIS gets uh, more grant money from appropriate sponsors, they might, they might consider those. Uh, there are some other operational advantages that, uh, that I listed in, in my article uh, you might want to think about. But operational independence from offshore, I think, is, is, is a valuable commodity. It's not, it's not a be-all, end-all. I think we'd like to set initial conditions when you have those forward forces, marine expeditionary units. You can get in early and you can set initial conditions. You're not always having to react to an enemy's first move. You can generate surprise. You extend the competitive space. You know, he, he thinks you can only land in a certain area because you need some airfield, but, you know, we can get ashore some other place. You're extending the battle phase both in depth because I can get deep at 400 miles or I can come through the beach and get in quickly. You're extending the, his operational problem, You're diluting his defenses, posing dynamics and dilemmas that he might not be prepared for because we're more, more multidimensional than, than he is. Rapid force closure is something we tend to overlook. Um, you know, the, the Marine unit coming on board a ship, some Army units can get there, I think, even quicker than the Marines. But the Marines will come with a full kit, the command and control, the logistics. It'll be a cohesive unit that can maneuver from at sea ashore. Doesn't need 10 days to set up, doesn't need five days, and when it shows up, it's got a couple weeks of uh, food and ammunition. It is a full up round when it gets there. That rapid closure, including the transition ashore, is, is pretty seamless. And then the organization can have the agility and I think the tempo that we want out of an operational force, particularly the early entry kind of forces. Not a war winning force, but the ability to make transitions from sea, from peace to crisis, from crisis to war, from at sea to ashore, from a stability operations into a fight. Kind of things that General Blackman did when he was out in the Pacific is I think an operational advantage that these forward uh, ready forces give you flexibly at sea. 
And with that, I'll conclude my remarks, and we'll go into Q&A, hopefully. Great. Thanks, everybody. I'm, I'm actually going to stand up now, talk from the uh, podium, or at least stand at the podium so I can see everybody. And if I can just push this back a ways so that the uh, panelists can actually see this table over here, uh, we'll begin with Q&A. So if we have any questions, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, Sandra Erwin with National Defense Magazine. I wanted to ask Frank Hoffman a follow-up question on the, this issue of air-sea battle um, being infatuated with the anti-axis threat, but ignoring, you, I believe you said, existential threats that we face elsewhere in Afghanistan or Iran. I mean, can you elaborate on what some of these threats are that are not being addressed? Uh, a little bit difficult for me because the air-sea battle concept that I know is a classified document. What's out in the public domain right now is, is a caricature of, of the concept. Uh, what the Air Force and the Navy have put together is a very detailed, um, comprehensive approach to, to the anti-access problem, which is the outer half. The, the ability to move from islands in the Western Pacific closer to some other large country that shall not be named uh, or to operate inside the Gulf at sea. It's the anti-access problem. Uh, it, it defeats the ability of an opponent, perhaps, to hold you at risk at long length. It still doesn't accomplish the things that uh, both Tom and I talked about, it, getting ashore, accomplishing something, holding something, saving somebody, seizing something, or destroying something ashore. That's the error denial challenge. ASB doesn't deal with the error denial challenge. There's another joint concept that's being, being developed to deal with that. But it's a holistic problem. You know, if when you read the, the literature, most people are, are, are using the shorthand A2, AD, but they're forgetting that AD part. Uh, the, a, the joint concept deals, I think, effectively with the, the back half of the problem about how you can operate effectively with freedom of action, free maneuver against somebody who's using EFPs, high-end RPGs, precision rockets, the guided rockets, artillery, mines and munitions problem, the GRAM threat that's, that's already ashore. So we, we're getting caught up into the, what I consider to be the, the, the emerging long-range challenge that ASB is focused on. It's real. You know, it's, it's, it's a legitimate effort to try to do this, and that concept uh, deals with that. But it, it, to me, it's not holistic enough to deal with both, both ends of the problem. It's only dealing with the A2, not the A2AD. Yeah, I gotta, if I could uh, kibitz on that. First of all, the, the focus of air-sea battle seems to be uh, sort of too operational and not uh, strategic enough. Um, particularly when applied to places like the Gulf and, and East Asia. Our, our goal is, is to preserve the axis that we currently have. So the goal of the adversary is to try to push us out of places that we already are. Also, we have allies and partners, uh, uh, you know, who are more reassured by the fact that we're there uh, than the fact that we might be able to fight our way back in at some uh, future date. And also, it, it is a, the fact that they're concentrating on this shows how, what a geostrategic hole the adversaries are in. Again, they're trying to push us back from their immediate doorstep. Uh, so, and uh, they have to go to war with the United States. They have to kill Americans in order to even uh, begin or threaten to kill Americans to intimidate their frontline states. That's a hugely good strategic bargain for us. So, uh, I, you know, I, Frank puts it pretty well. You know, the more, uh, you know, uh, ballistic missiles, for example, uh, that the Chinese buy, the less investment they have for other military capabilities that would uh, really be more decisive, uh, you know, in a, in a, in either a long-term strategic or political competition or in an actual war. And so I think we're kind of looking through the long set of lenses a lot of times, and we should begin with uh, looking at what victory looks like for us. Uh, and in fact, what we're trying to preserve is access that we already have. Uh, so let's, let's solve that puzzle, the access preservation puzzle. John, Denny in the back, all the way in the back. Hi, my name is John Denny from the SSI up at the Army War College. I've got two questions, actually. First for General Blackman. I think your assessment of the comparative advantage that American service members have uh, 
is spot on. Having spent several years working overseas, I've seen this firsthand. I'm curious to know, in your years of experience working for the military, have you seen any of our allies approach U.S., uh, could we say, capability in this regard? And if so, uh, could you comment on those experiences? And then my second question is for Mr. Donnelly. I think your analysis of the, uh, the, the problem facing the Army in terms of its force structures is spot on also. Uh, but the direction the Army appears to be moving in is away from, obviously, things like more corps and stand field armies and so forth. Uh, I see great value, though, in the, uh, the utility of those in achieving interoperability with our allies. And so are we going to lose that over the next couple of years, and how do we turn that around over the next uh, at least five years, given the budgetary situation? Bill Blackman. I think the, uh, generally speaking, the four eyes, um, UK, Australia, Canada uh, approach U.S. capability in that regard. Um, and I think it's as much uh, a cultural aspect uh, as it is anything else. Um, I, mean, I mean, there are some, some democracies, uh, quite frankly, Japan comes to mind, uh, where the culture tends to create um, uh, unbreakable hierarchy, if you will. Um, you know, we almost encourage subordinates to challenge seniors, uh, for example, um, which I think, to a point, is, is healthy. Um, you know, to challenge higher headquarters assumptions and, and those kinds of things. I mean, that's unheard of, quite frankly, um, in a, in a lot of armed forces around the world, with the possible exception, like I said, of the four eyes. Um, and, and I think all, all too often, you know, based on my comments and yours, we, we generally think only, uh, we, don't, we focus that thought at, at the lower end, you know, the, the squad leaders and second lieutenants and, and those kind of folks. But I think I think where we have to be careful that we maintain that edge is, fr frankly, at the very highest levels, that, that our senior officers um, feel that, that they're in a position uh, to, to challenge higher headquarters assumptions, uh, to, to challenge uh, DOD assumptions, if you will, in a, in a professional um, measured way. Um, I, I think that's... I think that's really healthy, and I think I think from top to bottom is is where we we hold that edge. Uh, I'm I'm very appreciative of of your comments. I think you're exactly right. You know, if it's one thing that we turn out to really need more of in the past ten years, it's it's not guys who could win a battle, but guys who could run a war. That is America's you know military comparative advantage over pretty much any other military uh, on the planet. Um, and we ought to preserve that and enhance that. And if we're gonna be in an era of a lot of small wars, you still have, to, you know, and you, even in an operation like Libya, which is a much more politically trying uh, uh, campaign than it was a, mil you know, a tactically trying campaign uh, in many ways. Uh, I think if you're looking to preserve the crown jewels of what we got and build some more, uh, you know, headquarters like that uh, and, and officers who are uh, trained uh, to run them are, are really, the, the, really the comparative advantage that we have. There's a lot of people who can bring a lot of infantry. Some nations can bring a lot of airplanes and a lot of tanks to the table. And, Nobody can bring too many ships to the table anymore, uh, but there's only one country that can put them all together to design a campaign that could win a war. We have a question right down here in the front. Uh, thank you, Andrea Bauman. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at SAIS. Um, it's been mentioned by two speakers that uh, it's the people, ultimately, that matter. And I was wondering whether the panel could comment on the challenge to train and prepare a force that is equally good at instilling fear and generating hope, as the general put it, 
and doing so within the same operation and often in oscillation, in quick oscillation um, in the same space and uh, the type of trade-offs that that might create. Is the answer kind of goes back to uh, General Krulak's view of, of, of the three-block war. Um, and, and again, going back to the quality of our, of our servicemen and women, um, I, you know, it's been my experience here, especially over the last 10 years, that, that uh, those young men and women are, are very capable of of making very um, very fine judgments and very uh, discerning decisions, if you will, and and I think some of that is a result of uh, education and and training. But I will tell you, I think I think an awful lot of it is 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 just the individual. I, I mean, I think the the going in product. Um, is prepared for that and and our training and education really do little more than sand the edges and and put a nice coat of varnish on it i I think the fundamental character uh, of the uh, individual service members um, puts them in a position to reestat back and forth in in minutes. I'd like to add to that comment if I could. I think this is among the hardest things that our, our military has to do. Now, in a, in a spirit of, of giving a little bit of my own background, I started my professional life as an aircraft designer. I actually designed some of the aircraft that uh, Tom and Frank have been talking about, uh, or their predecessors, not the, not the newer systems. My, my um, experience is a little more data than that. The joy about being an aircraft designer is, part of the purpose is to remove the humans as far away from the effect you're trying to generate as possible. And as an engineer, we actually wanted to get rid of pilots, too. We wanted uh, more unmanned aircraft and less manned aircraft, uh, with apologies to the pilots in the room. Um, what, I, what fascinates me about the problem you've asked, uh, the real human capital problem that all the services face, but I think is faced in the fashion you asked the question more acutely um, in the Special Operations Forces and the Marines and the Army, um, is that it's the most difficult thing. Um, I think the general's correct uh, that a lot of these human traits are innate uh, within the people that hopefully are attracted to these services, attracted to this kind of service. I think there are things the services can and, and should do um, to, uh, to match people uh, with jobs well. Um, there was a British experience uh, when the Northern Ireland um, conflict first began where they learned that they had to start a new training program to take uh, uh, British officers from the uh, Army of the Rhine um, and also from other places and sort of uh, steep them in uh, some of the tactics and techniques and philosophy they'd have to have in Northern Ireland. I believe that was called the NITAT, it was a, the NITAT, it was a special uh, program to, to train them and then when they came out after a shorter time frankly than the Marines or Army have faced in Afghanistan or Iraq uh, they had to be retrained again uh, in the conventional operations. This is kind of a long-winded way of saying you've put your finger on, I think, the hardest thing that the services face. And that's to identify those uh, individuals um, that have the right perspective for each kind of uh, activity you mentioned. Uh, but then um, the services obligation is to provide, to recognize the training that has to go into preparing them for that. Uh, and and um, sort of um, uh, redirecting, reorienting them when they come out. I, again, I'm a really simple-minded guy, uh, but uh, it'd be worth sort of asking ourselves the question, what is, what is the first hope of people in Afghanistan or people in Iraq? I would say that, that you know, if you gave them one wish and they were free to exercise it, they would say, please don't abandon us. So the thing that would give, uh, you know, people who have been living in a war zone the, the greatest hope for the future would be that they'll have a secure environment, you know, to do more normal uh, human activities, which they're perfectly capable of, of doing on their own. But absent that, that hope for security, you know, the hopes to, you know, become more educated or to develop socially or economically are always forestalled. But you've, you've identified a key readiness challenge for the, for the future, and it depends on what you think the future is. There's people in town who talk about 
uh, things going high and low in a conflict spectrum, that we need to worry about very low issues and provide a lot of hope to failed states. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have some very high-end uh, threats to deal with in space and cyber, and missiles should be what we'd be investing in, and kind of ignore the middle. If you're like me, I see a lot of things converging in the middle. I see people that are non-state actors acquiring higher-end capabilities and blending and blurring them in such a way that this is my hybrid threat argument that uh, you need to focus on that. And some people think of that as the middle of the conflict spectrum, but uh, I think it's a little, a little more chaotic than that. But something to think about. Uh, Dave Johnson's work at RAND was uh, cited again today, and I, I commend that to your attention. He talks about minding the middle, where this convergence is, is perhaps the more likely and, and perhaps uh, equally consequential as high-end warfare. And it's a good pivot point, perhaps, to posture our ground forces to be ready for. We just need to make sure that it's true readiness and not rhetorical. Uh, I worked for General Krulak in the mid-1990s and tried to help him implement the three-block war and strategic corporal concept, and we failed. And I went away, came back, and in uh, the early 2000 period and was working for General Mattis and got the same task. You know, let's, let's add to the squad leader's course. Let's make the strategic corporal, you know, real, not just a phrase, because we failed in the 90s to implement what General uh, Krulak's vision was because some people focused on our, uh, our naval routes and operating at sea and, and, and didn't see a need to empower corporals to do things that we now take for granted. Uh, as we do the downsizing and or decompression of defense spending, some things are going to be thrown away, some things are going to be put on the shelf, and some things are going to be institutionalized. The things that we now take for granted among our ground uh, NCOs, the things that uh, we've empowered them to do, are things we need to ensure that we institutionalize. My name is Carl Osgood. I write for uh, Executive Intelligence Review. I really wanted to pick up on the comments that General Blackman made about the uh, immaculate war, uh, because what you all just have said in response to the last question is what we don't do if we're fighting an immaculate war. Uh, I mean, the, the, the idea that comes to my mind is using special forces and uh, predator drones to go after fighter Al-Shabaab fighters in Somalia, but has no effect on improving the conditions, the living conditions of the people who live in the country. So I'd, I'd like to ask if the dependence, the, the, the uh, name enamoration with this immaculate war actually might have a, a, the effect of backfiring on us, of having a, an effect that maybe we don't desire. I, mean, I think it absolutely has the potential to backfire on us. Um, you know, war has a, you know, um, one of our dear, one of those dead Germans that we hold so, so dear here that we've talked about a couple of times, um, you know, you, you know, th 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 this is a human endeavor. It's, it's, a, it's a conflict between people. Um, and, and to believe that, that we can take that element out of it, that we can, we can fight a war, you know, tens of thousands or 10,000 miles away from Whiteman Air Force Base it misses the reality of it. Um, yes, our technological advantage uh, increases, you know, literally daily, um, but ultimately it, it, is a, it is a, it's a test of wills between, between people. And ultimately that, you know, nation to nation test of will, um, it, it rolls downhill to, to the corporal and the sergeant and, and his squad on the ground who, who are being asked to make extraordinary decisions uh, in seconds or less. Um, so I, I think it's a tremendous mistake to go down that track. And as has been referenced before, we, we thought we could do this some years ago. I, I was trying to think, who was the uh, vice chairman uh, Navy guy, guy um, Owens. Owens, Owens, who, you know, created this box, if you will, where we would have perfect understanding. I mean, absolutely perfect understanding of what was going on inside that box. Well, it's been some years, you know, that was what, in the mid-90s or so. It's been a long time, and my gosh, we don't know in places like Afghanistan, what's going on around the next corner or over the next rise in the ground. So um, we just got to 
I think, get away from that. I think that last point's key. Um, we can always, you know, within the Beltway, within this um, uh, building, we can always sort of assume away future conditions. We can make a decision or we can uh, promote a decision for what we're going to plan for, what we're going to resource or invest towards. But we can't decide what challenges we're ultimately going to face. And I think oftentimes in past conflicts, you've seen us enter in with, with one set of um, uh, plans, uh, notions about what we wouldn't do, but ultimately found ourselves in a different kind of conflict or a different kind of situation. So I think it's very important to recognize that going in. And I think it's important not to be too enamored of the technologies, which is, I think, the important point that was raised earlier. I, I can't resist. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, if one reads the papers lately, it begins to look like we're in this kind of uh, silent war when it comes to Iran. Uh, and actually to conceive of what's happening on the FPAC border is, is simply an anti-Al-Qaeda war is, is probably wrong too. So we may be closer than we imagine to uh, finding out what the downsides of uh, drones plus covert action plus Stuxnet viruses and things like that uh, uh, turn out to be. And if it, you know, drives our enemies uh, who are, you know, have a different cost-benefit analysis than we do to do things like hire uh, Mexican Zeta hitmen to go blow up Georgetown restaurants uh, to kill Saudi ambassadors, um, that's a lot of blowback. Time for one more question, and that's right here. Uh, my name is Bob Simpson. I work at TRADOC uh, in the uh, Army Capability Integration Center. I, I'd like to avail myself of the uh, ability to challenge a superior here. Um, and I want to make sure I understand the panel's position on what comparative advantage is. There's a difference, I think, in appreciating the sacrifices and skill of our soldiers uh, tactically and saying that they are the national comparative advantage uh, at a minimum uh, I would suggest you can't draw that conclusion from our fights against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban uh, unless you're saying, and this is my question, that were the technological capabilities reversed and they had air dominance and our systems and individual kit, would the uh, innate exceptionalism of our soldiers have caused us to still win uh, the tactical engagements um, or would our uh, exceptional ability to manage war overcome uh, that kind of advantage. Uh, if I'm looking to cut the defense budget, I would love to be able to say, well, the innate exceptionalism of our soldiers will overcome me cutting the F-35 and all of these other technological programs. Um, and I'd like to start with General Blackman since you challenged the idea that our technological advantage is a comparative advantage. Um, what I said early on was a quote from that study somewhere, and, I, and it's America's conception of its natural advantage. Technology, in my mind, is not a natural advantage. Technology is, is bought and paid for. Um, and, and, and that's the direction I was going. Do, do I want to take on the Taliban or, or anybody else in the world, you know, e uh, on, on an equal footing? Absolutely not. We have... We are extraordinarily technically advanced, if you will. Um, we do have control of the skies. You know, we do have command and control cap capabilities that allow us to, to execute the OODA loop, you know, inside of, of our adversaries. Um, but I stand by the fact that our natural advantage if you will, the, that, that, that you really can't go out and, and procure from a defense contractor is, is those servicemen and women. Because they, they have taken that, you know, they, they're extraordinarily adaptable and they have taken those platforms that were bought and paid for to do in, in a lot of cases something completely different from what they're being employed now and they have found ways of optimizing all aspects of them in the current operating environment. I, I'm a self-confessed technology guy. I uh, started off as an aircraft designer, and I, I've never gotten too far from my technology roots. 
I don't think you'd ever want to give up uh, any technical advantage uh, willingly. I mean, if you can have it, that's a great thing. But I, what I'd like to do in response to your question is make an observation that Dr. Mel O'Neill, the former ASALT, um, uh, the recently um, ASALT had made, and that is there are situations uh, today where you don't have a local technical advantage. And an example that he would like to talk about is that, that squatter, that tactical small unit on patrol somewhere, that sometimes, very often, more often than we'd like to believe, uh, does not have uh, UAVs or other eyes in the sky within sight of it, a long way away from uh, their, their higher headquarters or any source of support or help. They find themselves perhaps surprised uh, by an ambush, uh, and uh, oftentimes the adversary gets off the first shot. And what I'd like to say is in those situations, you're completely dependent on the, the comparative quality of those individuals in that unit. And in situations we face today, and those aren't the universe situations we'll face in the future, under, understood, uh, but you really are dependent on, you know, having the, the right quality of individuals and leadership in those units. And so I, I think that too often we think of technical solutions as was, has been observed earlier, um, as sort of our sine qua non or as the solution to too many different problems. And I think a more important place to start is with that human capital. Um, uh, General Frakely uh, made a comment one time that he would trade kit with anybody else and he would still uh, bank on his soldiers. I, I wouldn't want to trade kit, uh, but what I do want to take away from that comment is that we, we absolutely have to emphasize the, the quality of the individual, the training, the leadership, uh, and it's expensive, it takes a long time to do, uh, but I think it's absolutely requisite if we're going to maintain the kind of quality our armed forces have. Uh, I'd like to open the aperture a little bit. Uh, look, whatever is a comparative advantage is what drives trade, if we remember our classical economics. And in this regard, I would say American military power has really driven geopolitical trade and changed the fundamental nature of the competition for power in the world over the past decades. Great powers have disarmed in Europe and Japan. Uh, you know, uh, China didn't need to begin a military buildup. It got rich within the, you know, construct created by the United States and enforced by uh, the U.S. military. So overall, this is, and we've done it remarkably cheaply. We're down to, you know, four and a half or less percent uh, of our wealth, which is certainly over the last 60 years a historical low. So uh, we have reaped an immense comparative advantage in international politics by being the predominant military uh, on the planet. So uh, that's the kind of comparative advantage that I would like to hang on to for a while. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Dr. John Hamry, our president and CEO, and all of us here at CSIS, we are very grateful for your attendance today and the thoughtful questions you asked, and I'd ask you to uh, join me in a warm round of applause for our presenters.